What's up? What's up? What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Vanguard live podcast news, shit talking, whatever you want to call it. Welcome back, everyone. Hello, comrades. Uh, how you doing, my co-host Zach? None other. Yeah, what's up, man? How's it going? Um, pretty good. It's colder out than it was yesterday. I can't say I'm too much of a fan of that, but I do like the rain a little bit. We've kind of got the London fog aesthetic going on outside, so no complaints from the weather guard. Uh, you know, we always uh, start off our, our Midwestern pod here, this uh, this corn commie pod, with a little bit of a note about our Midwestern weather. Oh, how fickle it is. That kind of thing. Dad jokes galore. Uh, but yeah, we've got uh, what I would call a really solid tried and true vanguard leftist pod for you today got a little bit of last night on the internet energy got a lot of some uh serious stories to talk about just a standard amount of beef uh gonna be a good show yeah 100 percent. this is gonna be a spicy ass stream guys we got a lot of good stuff to talk about today many many topics that i'm excited to get into hash out our opinions on etc cetera, etc cetera. there's been some juicy ass drama going on so i'm ready to spill the tea as always uh, make sure to hit that like button if you're just um, showing up to today's stream. Helps us beat that algorithm. Hit that subscribe button as well. I did make the chat today subscriber only. So if you want to participate in the chat today, got to sur- got to subscribe to the Vanguard, guys. Oh, what is this tyranny Gavin's imposing? You got to haters have to subscribe now. You can't. You have to subscribe before you can call us want us MSNB. Wow, the the chips are getting. It's it's a steep price to pay here uh, at the vanguard but that's a good i didn't know we could fucking do that the good idea yeah you guys got to subscribe you know i look at our analytics sometime and there's like 50 percent of y'all that watch our videos but aren't subscribed so i'm like what the hell dude you're watching but you're just lurking you're not actually part of the vanguard community so we're part of that mass exodus that never stopped watching our show but just unsubscribed in protest yeah i remember you guys exactly exactly uh so yeah hit that subscribe button if for nothing else so that you can call us a piece of shit in the chat uh i always know that we never there's... censor our chat we don't have a mod exactly exactly unless you're saying some really heinous shit or like spamming us then you're pretty much free to to speak your mind uh, the shit about us just no slurs <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> uh but we do like to start our live streams as you guys know with a big shout out to our patron community uh the folks that make this show possible um, so without further ado, we'll give a big shout out to the patrons. Uh, what the hell? One second. Let me pull it up. Uh, but yeah, our patron community does keep the show afloat, especially in um, trying times such as these with Internet censorship at a at a all new highs. Uh, one sec, guys. Sorry, I'm trying to share my screen properly for some reason. Does not seem to want to be cooperating. It's a DIY podcast, guys. You give a shit about things like that? Well, you better fork over the cash, and one day uh, we'll have uh, uh, we'll have a, a resolution for that. Yeah, it does look like we're having a couple of sh- screen share issues, so hopefully that gets resolved because we're going to need that for today's live streams um, or today's commentary, rather. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I might have to dip out of the stream real quick, Zach, if you want to hold down the fort for just a second i'll be right back and hopefully this resolves itself and we can get to today's news yeah absolutely i'll tell you guys about this video that i was watching just before we went live because of the youtube algorithm Uh, instead of suggesting you things like progressive content god damn it now everything is falling apart in the studio we put up very few sound things when we first moved in we were like we don't know how sound works we don't know how hard it is to get your audio to set up if you're sitting like three feet away from each other that's why you can hear me and gavin's mic right now and all kinds of shit like that and it's just a, uh, it's a little bit of a shit show here at the Vanguard today, but that's why you guys love us, right? Because at least we're honest about our shit show. Yeah, and not 100% sure why it's not sharing the screen like it should. Might be some issues with StreamYard. Are you seeing anything on your end, Zach, as far as the screen? Uh, I can just see the yellow Vanguard screen, which is what I imagine the rest of the, the rest of the audience can see. Now I can see you again, and I think you can see me. All right, uh, let's try this. Does this work? Are you seeing this? Yeah, now we're good. Okay, good. So it looks like we're going to be fine for today's live stream, except for the patron shout-out screen. So apologies to the patrons. Uh, I'm sure that'll get worked out by our next edition. Yeah, we'll cut it in after the show or something. Yeah, you. yeah. So, yeah, huge shout-out to the patrons regardless, though. You guys know the drill. Link's in the description of this video and all of our live streams and video content. If you want to hit up that uh, you know, patron page, really does help out some comrades. Um, If you enjoy our show and the content we create, uh, recurring donations via Patreon really, truly help 
uh, makes the show possible. We couldn't do it without you guys. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. Uh, really genuinely appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I guess we can just get right into today's, you know, news dive right into the muck as they would say, um, lots of good topics to talk about today. A lot of interesting drama and news happening in lefty internet world. So let's break it down. Is there anything that you want to start with sec? Oh God. Yeah. I guess we should give everybody a taste of a little bit of what, what they uh, came for. So let's just go ahead and start off with some, some of the he mildly hefty beef. And then we'll get into the, just like all out fucking war path. The apology and swear engine was on as you put it last night, Gavin. So uh, I think we should start out with uh, uh, like this. Uh, the, the, let's, let's talk a little bit about Vaj contra points. Let's start easy. Let's make everybody be patient and wait for the, that's going to be like our most controversial take though. Everyone's going to just mass leave. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know it's, that's the bitch of the van. Wait, did I get that's the bitch of the Vanguard. That's the Vanguard way. <laughs> yeah, let's start. Well, actually, there's one thing I, I really quickly want to talk about. Let's just do a few quick news stories really quick before we get into the beef. All right, Zach just left. We're going to... I didn't leave. I just don't know why he paused me for a second. Here we go. He's going to be right back. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, guys. We're just, you know, do not have our shit together today. But yeah, let's... I wanted to look at this. This is pretty funny. You guys, you guys might have heard the rumors about Rokana potentially being handpicked by Bernard Sanders as his, you know, heir to the political revolution, whatever you want to call it. Doesn't even really feel like much of a revolution these days. But uh, this was an article that was published um, by Politico. Top figures from Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign are privately encouraging the California congressman to run for president in 2024 if Joe Biden does not seek a second term and this article you know goes on to explain that folks like jeff weaver and of course bernie himself are kind of you know uh, encouraging kana behind the scenes to maybe give it a go if he uh, if again biden doesn't seek a second term um and obviously you know i, I don't think that rokan is the right guy to do this but what i thought was interesting was some of the reactions even from people that traditionally are a little bit more into the whole progressives in congress the squad kind of uh energy including david dole um he says sorry but ro Khanna is too polished to do well on the national stage in the current political climate democrats need someone loud and angry for all the right reasons uh, and i i feel the same way i, I feel similarly honestly about marion williamson who's been floated quite a bit as a potential potential insurgent challenger um you know even even if you put their political disagreements i have aside um, they're just too nice. You know, they're too civil. Uh, Bernie's biggest problem is that he wasn't able to really scold Joe Biden, really wasn't able to point the finger and call out his corruption. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. And I think we would see the same kind of thing from a David Dole or a Marion Williamson or, or one of these folks. Um, again, they're better than your average Democrat. Yes. Uh, but there's just so many issues that they've dropped the ball on and, and totally cozying up to the Democratic establishment rather than choosing to continue challenging it in a robust way uh, like we would need, honestly, for a serious insurgent challenge to the establishment to be uh, even remotely effective. So, you know, I, I do not think Ro Khanna is the right choice for this for obvious reasons. For one, he has all of these conflicts of interest with his stock trading, something that's not talked about enough, but is pretty goddamn sketchy, to be honest. Um, also, recently, he was, you know, praising the Clintons on Twitter, stuff like that. I find super cringy. Uh, again, just you know, if you're going to challenge the establishment, the Democratic establishment, you have to challenge the Democratic establishment. You can't just be like, oh, I'm going to play nice and pretend to be friends half the time and offer some very mild, tepid criticism 10% of the time. Like, no, if you're going to challenge them, you actually, you actually have to challenge them so this is pretty crazy to me yeah you know it's oh god it's so funny like right after you and i do an entire geo stream segment where we're like fuck rokana like this is the end this is the final straw like you've revealed yourself as a neoliberal the obamification is complete yada 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 yeah you had some good ideas and you've uh, pushed for some good things but you're no ally you're kind of just like okay go along get along if it's you know uh you know if he's supporting the right thing then fine that's good let's have him along with us obviously but you know i don't ever think we're gonna look i'm gonna look to him for like moral guidance or clarity uh you know he's made that clear he just again voted for aid to go uh military aid right just fucking weapons um 
expanding the military industrial complex uh as you said rehabilitating uh hillary clinton and not only rehabilitating hillary clinton doing so by saying that she's somehow like a defender of democracy when he was literally working side by side with bernie sanders on the campaign when she explicitly undermined the democracy of the democratic primaries and like in behind closed doors the democratic primary would be like we're a private institution we don't have to fucking do a goddamn democratic thing but publicly they would have more stalwarts of democracy, right? So you remember all of that. He's just playing along in this historic whitewash. And then also, uh, again, touting her husband, Bill. What the fuck? That dude, create, that dude is equally responsible as any other living soul for the economic crisis that is unfolding right now. Uh, the complete uh, ripping out of the bedrock of the American working class, whatever was left of it at the time. Uh, I, I mean, how are you going to do this? So the fact that Jeff Weaver, okay, remember when it was big news that Jeff Weaver had actually po like proffered that maybe Bernie Sanders shouldn't look away at uh, billionaire super PAC money? Like, you know how Elizabeth Warren did the pivot guys at the end of her campaign where she started taking PAC money to, to sustain herself? Jeff Weaver wanted Bernie Sanders to do that. Bernie Sanders was like, no, at least he still had his like some shreds of his principles left. And, you know, he wasn't doing things like supporting NATO and shit at the time. Um, so anyway, all of this stuff is to say that Ro Khanna proved himself to be safe enough that they could get behind him now because they're completely toothless. Uh, and this is extremely bummer. It's an extreme bummer. That's all I have to say. 100%. And there's a quote from this article I wanted to share too that I think gets to the heart of this matter. Um, again, Team Bernie is reportedly considering Ro Khanna to run in 2024. God damn it. I hate Yahoo News and all these freaking ads. Anyway, um, here's a quote. Sorry about the ads, guys. I can't I can't share my brave browser right now. But he says, I'm not running in 2024. Kana 45 said, I fully expect the president to run and intend to support him strongly. <laughs> so it's like, what a great place to start from. Uh, why are you even considering challenging the Democratic establishment if you think everything is a OK right now? If you think that, you know, Biden is worth supporting strongly, then wouldn't that also mean that his heir to the throne, Kamala Harris, who basically represents the same vein of neoliberalism and corporatism. Uh, why even get involved then? Why not just let them run the show? You know, if you think that uh, he's worth supporting strongly and, you know, you barely ever call him out in a serious or aggressive way, which is just, you know, such a disappointing transition in energy from, again, the, the political revolution of Bernie Sanders. They use the term revolution. Uh, the point was that the Democratic Party is so broken that we have to infiltrate it and take it back by force uh, that we can't, you know, be friendly with these people, that we have to banish them and get them out because they are traitors to the people. They're, you know, corrupt corporate vultures. Uh, that's what I want to hear, Ro Khanna, not uh, I intend to support the president strongly in 2020. For like, no, if you're going to challenge the establishment, then fucking challenge it. Like, I, I just hate this mealy mouthed garbage. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I, I think that, I mean, it, yeah, I, like there's no more, nothing else to say other than that. He proved that he was safe enough for people to like that, for like that to get behind him. And that's what he's continuing to try and do. Maybe audition, try and, you know, continue to signal to the Democratic establishment that he's not some leftist, you know, that he can still kind of elevate his career. I mean, it just seems like blatant careerism to me. Uh, again, that Obamification. Right. Uh, you know, maybe he came in with uh, good aspirations, wanted to end the wars, whatever the fuck. Uh, clearly, he doesn't care about ending wars now as he's sending aid to Ukraine uh, with the U.S. And, 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 and that's even bullshit. Streaming. You're like aid to Ukraine doesn't sound that bad. U.S. weapons to accelerate uh, what is going to be a global crisis. Right. I'm just saying that's what we're doing. Uh, so, I, you know, can't really get behind that uh, as, a, as an anti-war guy. Uh, you know, uh, all kinds of, of crazy shit uh, about that. But uh, while we're on the topic of, uh, of regular uh, news stories, I do have one more that I also want to get to. Gavin, did you want to do the Charlie Kirk one next, though? Oh, yeah. Let's uh, segue into that in a second. Did want to shout out a couple super chats. Thank Mike H for the two bucks, Roe or Joe. I mean, obviously, Khan is better than Biden. But like, you know, at this point, he's basically just your normie Democrat. I appreciated the fact that he came out against no fly zones. Um, but to his credit, Joe Biden's also remained steadfast on refusing to implement no fly zone. So, you know, I, I, again, obviously, you know, Ro Khan is uh, I prefer his politics, his vision of the Democratic Party to Joe Biden's by a bit. But it seems like 
that's shrinking day by day, and he's just basically transforming into a normie Democrat. Uh, and if he is really considering running in 2024, then I think that explains a lot of his moves as of late, you know, kind of indicating that, no, he's not going to boldly challenge the Democratic establishment. He's cozying up to it. That's why he's praising the Clintons, whitewashing their legacy. Um, that's why he's, you know, acting buddy-buddy with people like Elizabeth Warren, who stabbed Bernie in the back. Like, I don't know. It's just super disappointing. <laughs> Do you know what else is, it kind of makes me realize is like how easy it is to build your reputation as a leftist when the Democrats aren't the party in power. And then once they become the party in power, how you kind of just become a lap dog again. And I think we saw that across the board with the squad. I think we're seeing it with Ro Khanna. I think we're fucking seeing it with Bernie Sanders. Right. Oh, it was so easy to fire shots at Donald Trump, of course, and be like the Democrats need to do these things writ large. Yada, yada, yada. Well, now that these people are in charge, Bernie wants to fucking support them for some stupid reason probably because he helped get them all elected um but it, it, it just it, it leads to this weird brain rot where you're trying to benefit your career and not get sidelined and like uh i don't know it, it's all gross so yeah I, I mean honestly i would not vote if it were Roe or joe at, at this point uh that's a lie i would vote for rokana but i wouldn't like it yeah, it would. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just pretty much impossible to get excited about that possibility at this point. And again, if even like the the David Doles of the world can't get excited about this, then who exactly is Rokana's constituency? Uh, I mean, it, it, it too, you know, we shit on TYT all the time. We're going to do so later in this stream. Um, but to their credit, the only like serious piece of journalism they've produced in the last year or so is uh, a series of pretty hard hitting interviews with Rokana, where you know Jane himself, the, the the man who originated the whole progressives in Congress, you know, squad. Uh, justice Democrat idea, even he's like clearly like, bro, you're just lying. You've completely fumbled the ball on the whole build back better negotiation. Um, so yeah, if even people like Jank Uger and David Dole are kind of cringing and like, you know, like, I don't know about this, then again, what does that tell you about Rokanda and who exactly is his constituency anyway? Uh, it's not looking good, guys. Anyway, thank you also, Matt Ocelot. God is always for the two bucks. David Anthony or Dave Anthony for president. Not super familiar with Dave Anthony. I think he's like a comedian or something. Um, but I'll definitely look into him if you think he's worthy of the of the highest office in the land, Matt Ocelot. I'll have to take your word for that. Yeah, I have no idea who that is. I'm sorry. Yeah, but let's did you want to uh, segue into a different story, Zach? Yeah, I just saw this yesterday and I thought it was so fucked up. I couldn't believe it. And then I was like, well, I should believe it because this is the West. But this was on CNN. So and I just want to set the stage and set the table with how CNN led basically every single story that they ran during the Trump administration with the fact that, like, you know, Republicans are only Republicans because they're white supremacists and that they are. Uh, or uh, by and large, that was a real story that, that that was what they consistently ran with. And and I'm not excusing a lot of the bad behavior by Republicans. A lot of them are fucking white supremacists and that's deplorable. But CNN really has no ground to stand on when it comes to these accusations. And and I wanted to and uh, I mean, I'm not the one that's for sure, like uh, sharing this with everybody for the first time. Uh, it was making its rounds around Twitter. This is from Minpress News reporter Alan uh MacLeod, uh who does a lot of good reporting you should follow him on twitter if you haven't already uh but let me just go ahead and play this for everybody uh and then i'll read the quote also because it's kind of hard to hear so what is nato gonna do uh can you hear gavin you know it's one thing for sarin gas to be used okay as here. let me try and get this again oh. yeah you might have to turn up your audio guys just a bit for this clip yeah let me get the audio as high as i can it's kind of low quality but yeah turn it up and then i'll read the quote anyway but i want everybody to know this is real and i'm not fucking with you this is as yeah seems like fertile ground for a false flag operation so what is nato gonna do if you know it's one uh, yeah for... let me see if i can find the other version here uh give me one second guys let me play this really quick i yeah. Thanks, Steve, for the five bucks. Dear Dave Anthony, the dollop pod. Yeah, I've heard of the dollop pod. I need to check it out. Like I said, said we should see if empty houses at gunpoint and give them to the homeless. Sounds like an idea I'm down with. 100%. Gavin just uh, got us removed from uh, <laughs> in, in Roblox. I'm okay with that idea. Uh, anyway. Yeah, this is crazy. Operation. So, what is NATO going to do if? You know, it's one thing for sarin gas to be used on people in faraway Syria who are Muslim and who are of a different cu culture. What is Europe going to do when it's on European soil done to Europeans? Are they going to intervene? Are they going to keep sit standing back? And if they do intervene, how far are they willing to go? And are they willing to have a direct confrontation with Vladimir Putin, which is what he seems to want? 
Okay, just here. Let me, let me just say a couple of things there. One, did everybody know how before she said culture, she actually almost said of a different color? She just straight up almost said, these people who are of a different cu culture, like, are you freaking kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? These are the people who want to go to war. and Like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. It, no, 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 no. This is how Western framing is so fucked up. This is CNN, guys. This is not Fox News. This is like the most ridiculous framing ever. It's okay when what we what Obama did to Syria was completely fine. Those were brown people. Who cares about that? But we're gonna have a serious problem if there's a big war in Europe. Like that that's white people there. Like are this that was explicitly what she said. I'll read the quote in a second. But Gavin, what's your initial take? I mean, it's just insanity. And yeah, it's like, it's just crazy how much racism is embedded into our media and the Western perspective. It's like, you genuinely get the sense that they don't view these human beings as part of the same species. Like, we're all human beings. You do realize that, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you live in Syria or Uzbekistan or Russia or Nebraska. Like, we are all human beings, right? Let's like everyone's aware of this, right? It doesn't it doesn't make you a different species to be from a part of the globe where people are brown skinned. Like, what the fuck? It's literally asinine. So for anybody who had audio issues, maybe couldn't hear because it was a little like muddled for you. Let me go ahead and read you this quote. So it's one thing for this is a direct quote. I swear to God, it's a direct quote. It's one thing for sarin gas to be used on people in faraway Syria who are Muslim and of a different, she almost says color, but corrects herself to say culture, as if it's much fucking better. What is Europe going to do when it is on European soil done to Europeans? So we all understand if we pass the like second grade, what the fuck she's talking about here, right? Oh, it's one thing for sarin gas, a chemical fucking weapon to be used against Syrians who are brown and Muslim, that's one thing but what happens if it's done to us <gasps> what happens if it's done to people who look like us <gasps> what the fuck is the matter like this is like it, this could have been a clip in like 1850 guys like i can't fucking believe this is real broadcast on cnn who again i make the point to you this is not fox news which is like made a career out of dog whistling to white supremacists this is a new thing for them specifically to validate uh, the war in Russia like it's a really weird position remember when Rachel Maddow had the dude on that like tried to like whitewash the severity of the Holocaust and was like no real Jews were or uh, Germans were killed in the Holocaust like no German speaking people were fighting. like yeah of course they were they were German speaking Jewish people that were fucking loaded into ghettos and then executed by a mass murderer named Hitler. Like, like these are just facts about history right uh I don't know this shit is all wild and it's like society's been put in a blender to try and justify this horseshit war yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely crazy. I was just shocked when I saw that clip that you sent me yesterday, Zach. Thank you also for the super chat. Uh, Estev08199, uh, really appreciate the donation. What are your general thoughts on Michael Tracy? To be completely honest, guys, I actually don't have m many thoughts on Michael Tracy. I keep meaning to check out his work and keep forgetting to. Um, it, it somehow eluded me. I shit you not. I, I really am honestly not very familiar with his takes, opinions, or political persuasion. I know he's kind of controversial, uh, but I'm going to avoid taking a position on Tracy just because I'm really not familiar with his work, to be honest. Yeah, see, the funny thing about Michael Tracy is that like sometimes I'll see jokes about him on Twitter from leftists, and I'm like, oh, that was pretty funny. Uh, and then sometimes I'll see Glenn defending him, and that's about all I know about the guy. Uh, I really have no opinion about him at all. I, I feel like there's probably... like This is just a gut reaction... I thought I, I feel like uh I feel like he's probably like a hot take substack guy. I don't know anything else about him though. I have no idea. He sure knows how to trigger the libs. That's all I know. Yeah, but that's literally all I know. <laughs> yeah, I will check him out though, because I don't want to be an ignoramus. My job is to know what other people in the leftist media space are saying. So uh you got me there. But thanks for the super chat and I'll look into Michael Tracy for better or for worse and report back to you. Thank you for the super chat. Thank you also. Uh, Lakes girl for the five bucks. They don't care about people, only money, oil stocks in the military industrial complex. Um, yeah, 100% correct. Yeah, 100% correct. And and really, 
is, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the media. What they really care about is their ratings, making everything sound as sensational as possible, uh, making you know World War III as much of a possibility as possible because that would be the best thing that ever happened to their ratings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, hundred percent agree. Yeah, the, essentially what their biggest goal is is that they sell as many weapons as possible. That we they make as much money off of oil as possible, and then our politicians are satisfied because they keep getting uh, the you know large crumbs and donations and bribes from those individuals and and it all just keeps feeding into a big machine until we die from climate catastrophe or nuclear war exactly correct 100 percent. thank you so much for the super chat uh and let's segue into today's drama or at least the first part of it uh do you want to just get right into this paula jean swear engine stuff zach yeah unless you wanted to do the religion thing which i'm down with well too. we're gonna do that too at, at, during the stream we'll probably be going for at least an hour or two today guys so stick around we have a lot of good stuff but uh this is something we teased in the headline that i'm sure everyone is you know waiting for with bated breath being like can you guys shut the hell up about serious things i want to hear about this drama you don't uh, care what you guys think about the fucking serious <laughs> issues this is the goddamn grift guard <laughs> Exactly. So we know who we are. We know our place. Uh, let's look here. Paula Jean Swearingen. This was last night. Fired this off at uh, 8.15 p.m. and kept going into the night, late into the night. Paula Jean Swearingen was out here uh, just on the war path with Jimmy Dore and his ilk. Uh, let's take a look here. She says, I want to apologize to anyone that I tried to convince the People's Party was a viable alternative in electoral politics. Out of my years... As an activist, I have never worked with someone as toxic as Nick Brana. Theatrical abuse through podcasts is not how you win elections. So, woo, coming in hot, uh, calling people out by names, um, and taking no prisoners while she's at it. So, apology and swearing is coming out here and saying, basically, I apologize to anyone who I led into this grift, this disaster, you know, burning ship of a party that, by the way, still has. Uh, seemingly no plans to run any candidates in 2022, despite gaslighting their supporters into believing that to be the case. Um, so yeah, it's just a you know flailing vanity project for Nick Brana at this point. A huge waste of resources. Nick Brana admitted that they lost twenty thousand dollars to graphic design, which never materialized. That's one of the many sketchy aspects of their you know financial records. Uh, so, whoo, I mean, it's, it's not good. And obviously I'm sure Paula Jean feels embarrassed for ever having repped this organization and, you know, siphoned money away from people that's heart, whose hearts were in the right place. I mean, it's disgraceful. Right. And, and to be honest, at one point I was also like, what the hell, Paula Jean, like you're better than this. What are you doing? Uh, you know, promoting this obvious scam, this obvious grift of a third party when there are real third parties like the greens, uh, that could really use your support. So, you know, totally disappointing, but again, credit where it's due she's coming out now she's saying hey guys i i effed up this was this was not right um and i apologize to anyone that i tried to convince it was a viable alternative it's clearly very toxic and we'll go into some of the details uh, as to why but i do just want to remind everyone that paula jean swearingen is not someone that just you know joined the people's party a month ago and you know didn't love the vibe so she peaced out or what like no she actually got arrested with Nick Brana and Jackson Hankel, along with a few other folks in front of the Capitol. Um, and we can, we can talk about how serious of an, of an arrest it was, but, but still the point is she went out and protested with Nick Brana and, and Jackson Hankel and other people's party members. Um, her heart was actually in this. Like, I, I seriously believe she thought this was the right path that she thought she was, you know, fighting for a righteous cause, um, et cetera. So, you know, it's not like, again, it's not like she just joined this and, you know, was kind of, eh, I don't really like it. No, she was really invested in this, uh, which tells me that, you know, she wouldn't be coming out here with this sort of a statement. Um, she wouldn't be coming out here, uh, and naming names and really, you know, going after these folks if she didn't have a pretty good reason to, because again, she's sacrificed a lot of her own credibility in this process. A lot of, People, you know, initially were unamused that she was giving credibility to the People's Party. And now a lot of people that, you know, respected her for giving credibility to the People's Party are, are now unamused because she's backing out. So, you know, needless to say, it's it's been a bit of a, a roller coaster for Paula Jean Swearingen. And it, I can't exactly say she's, you know, benefited from any of this. It's not like, I mean, she, she you know, put in her two weeks of the People's Party. She, uh, she no longer works for them. So that's a sacrifice in pay. It's not like this is really in any way helping her to come out. She's clearly doing it because she feels like she has to because she actually has a you know ounce of goddamn integrity and a backbone and is willing to call out abuses where she sees them 
Um, before we get to her next tweet, which directly names Jimmy Dore, what was your reaction to seeing this one, Zach? Yeah, I was actually just scrolling Twitter last night, and we I thought this was going to be like a one-off tweet, and then we were just deluged with so much more uh so many more takes from uh, Paul Jean Swear Swearingen, but yeah, just this is a hundred percent where where she needs to be coming from at this point. Like, look, uh, tough love, uh, right? Uh, like the, the information about all this was available to Paula to access before she joined the People's Party. So I do think an apology is in order. Uh, that being said, I also agree that her heart was in the right place, and even though I thought that was an entirely a, like a joke arrest protest uh, when it happened, uh, they literally like asked the police uh to arrest them uh I, I, like I'll, uh, you know so i don't know how serious that was i don't know who they were liberating or whatever but sure i'll concede her heart was in the right place fine but she used to be, guys what, what's a bummer about this is like to me like i remember watching paula jean swear in the first time and knocked down the house right the, which came out in like 2018 2019 right um and she was based right she looks like a freaking john denver song you know west virginia ma, 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 right i was like fuck yes dude we need this energy on the left like she's just a regular person with base politics okay fuck yes right uh yeah john denver was actually from roswell new mexico we can talk about that on a different podcast i'm kidding <laughs> but <laughs> um, um but anyway like she was so based and then she actually won the democratic primary in 2020 guys as a democrat uh, she won. She still lost to Joe Manchin. They, you know, he had a shit ton more money. And look at what the fuck he's done to it. Technically, she was running against uh, the other right. Senate. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my bad. What the fuck was the other guy's name? I'm sorry. I fucked up my own. Record. Honestly, I forget who the guy was she lost to in 2020. But she was the Democratic nominee for the Senate and then lost to, I believe, the incumbent Republican, uh, which, again, I mean, it's, it's pretty hard for a Democrat at this point to win in West Virginia. So it's not really a reflection of her necessarily as much as it just is how tough it is to win in the state like that as a Democrat, especially a super progressive lefty one. Yeah, 100 percent. Either way. Sorry, I fucked that up, guys. But either way, uh, she was able to secure the Democratic nomination for Senate, not against Joe I'm sorry. That was fucked up. Um, so anyway, what I'm saying was is she had a serious powerhouse base in West Virginia. She probably still does. Uh, it's definitely going to be dampened after you try to get everybody to uh, get involved with what was obviously a known scam at that point. I'm going to be honest, like you're going to take a credibility hit. But I, I don't think it's over for, for Paula Jean Swearingen. Like I would love to see her run for, uh, you know, state office in uh, West Virginia. I think that she could definitely let like if you can win uh, a, a senate nomination of the democratic party in west virginia i think you could probably win like a like a rep like a state seat or like a you know like a state senate seat something like that like i don't want her to disappear from politics i think her voice is really needed i think her perspective is really needed and i think that she could build back the trust of people because uh the fact of the matter is is she was like i was kind of pissed when i found out that she was going to the people's party one because i knew the people's party was a scam at this point and two, because she brought real credibility. When I saw that Paula Jean Swearingen was going there, I was like, oh, fuck. People are going to be, like, taking this more seriously now. Um, so that's a problem. And she's going to have to do some, like, a little bit of rehabilitation, kind of like what she's doing now. Uh, now. I think that's why she's going so scorched earth, dude, because she probably feels betrayed. And, like, she was fed a bunch of horseshit information. And she probably feels, like, embarrassed that she fell for it. Like, everybody can understand where she's coming from. That's why... Gavin and I are making fucking videos, like slamming the shit out of her. No, she's actually doing the right thing. She's actually coming clean. She's actually doing like all you can ask for when you've made a political miscalculation. Um, but at the end of the day, like she does still have some like work to do. And I think she's doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the way that Nick Brana and the other leaders of the People's Party handled the sexual harassment allegations leveled against Nick was really the last straw for Paula Jean Swearingen. Of course, she knew the accuser who has yet to come forward publicly. And of course, this is another big issue. The, the accuser didn't want to have her accusation be a, a big public affair, a big circus. She wanted to be handled in private like you have every right to have it handled if you work for an organization. Like, can you imagine if you worked at, you know, some some corporation and Apple. you... Yeah, Apple. And, and you were like, hey, my boss is harassing me. Um, and then they went public with that information and let the entire, you know, populace yeah, cook. Go. Yeah, exactly. Like that's that's the most unprofessional, disgusting way to handle it possibly, because, again, people have the right to have these affairs dealt with behind the scenes in private with the HR department or, or whatever the hell handles that kind of issue. Um, it's not the public's business until the accuser wants to go public and, and that's like the most obvious rule ever you know like that's like just basic like 
you know, practices for any sort of political organization. And the fact that Nick Brana and crew violated that uh, came forward with these allegations. And according to Status Coup's excellent reporting on this, even threatened her behind the scenes, had a attorney email this accuser and say, essentially, you better shut up or we're going to sue you. Um, it's just the opposite of how a leftist or progressive organization should handle uh, this sort of affair. It's totally, totally crazy. Um, and yes, I can see this message. I don't know why I just noticed this, but I can see your message, Marxist Leninist. But yeah, uh, let's move on to the next um, Paula Jean tweet because it does get even spicier if you can believe it. She starts naming some more names, um, those who are complicit in the sanitization of Nick Brana's potential crimes uh, and, and continue to prop him up without doing any sort of do journalistic due diligence. She says, fuck Jimmy Dore and his comedy platform. Uh, I wasn't lying when I named this video, Jimmy Dore called out. Uh, she says, it's not real news and real people are struggling. Um, she then goes on to uh, add Jackson Hankel to the mix. She says, both Jimmy Dore and Jackson Hankel blindly defended their drinking buddy, Nick Brana, without hearing from staff and volunteers at People's Party US. If they believe this country shouldn't be run by the good old boy network, uh, they shouldn't have created podcasts preaching otherwise. So, wow. You know, she's naming names. Like I said, she's she's coming out here and, and telling it like she sees it. And to be honest, I think she's 100 percent correct in this characterization. Uh, I've been very honest on this show, guys, um, that I've, I've lost a lot of respect for Jimmy Dore and the way he handled this situation and any of the, jur the journalists out there that have covered it in a similar fashion, which is to only talk to Nick Brana, to ignore and contribute to the smearing of the volunteers. And then when you are talking to Nick Brana, ask him no hardball questions like a real journalist would. Like, I don't have any problem with what, say, Sabby did when she had Nick Brana on. She had him on and asked him the tough questions uh, like a real journalist is supposed to. She sat down and was like, all right, these are the concerns. These are the issues. Let's address them one by one. Um, no problem with that. That's what, you know, journalists are supposed to do. That's what political commentators are supposed to do. Unfortunately, that's quite literally the opposite of what Jimmy Dore and Jackson Hinkle did. They had him on to repeat his smears without talking about or without talking to the volunteers themselves, without getting the volunteers, the actual workers side of the story. They essentially had on the CEO of this company, which is the People's Party. It's not actually a political party, by the way, um, to, again, run his mouth, smear these people with no evidence, without asking for evidence. Uh, so basically just a softball interview. No, no journalistic due diligence whatsoever. Uh, I said at the time, this is what they should show in journalism school as an example of literally what not to do when you have an interview with someone in a position of power or someone that's a leader of an organization that is soliciting donations, by the way, uh, from the audience of folks like Jimmy Dore and Jackson Hinkle um, with no results to show for it. But you know, and we've been on this hill for a while. You guys know our thoughts. Uh, anyway, I I'm glad to see Paula Jean out here, you know, naming names as well, identifying these folks and you know obviously we give jimmy Dore credit when he's right there's a number of issues i agree with him on such as third parties for example his refusal to participate in you know voting for you know corporate democrats for example or democrats or republicans you know his his opposition to the duopoly he's dead on when it comes to stuff like that uh it's just really unfortunate that those tendencies had to be channeled into such an outward joke of an organization which not only has no results but also it is fostering abuse and toxic behavior at seemingly every, every level. There's now, I think, a handful, four, five, six states, People's Party, which have broken off from the actual People's Party to create their own People's Party in response to the horrible situation um, that's going on there. So, you know, it's in states like North Carolina, I believe, in states uh, like Washington and Oregon, uh, their People's Party have literally split off and said, we're no longer a part of this. So it's not just Paula Jean Swearingen. It's not just, you know, the handful of ex-volunteers that you guys might be familiar with. No, it's people at every level of this organization that are like waving the red flag like, hey, this is fucked up. This is not worth contributing to. This is not worth expending your energy into. Uh, and again, I mean, this is kind of the last draw for me with Jimmy Dore. It's like it's just absolutely disgraceful and, and such the opposite of what he's uh, supposed to do and what he purports to do, the way he's handled the situation. Um, and, and again, Paula Jean Swearingen is someone that's been on Jimmy's show. Uh, if Jimmy had actual integrity when it came to this, he would have her back on to discuss this. He would invite her on and say, hey, what's going on? 
you're a friend of the show. We've talked multiple times. Uh, you got arrested with Jackson Hinkle. Uh, what's what's happening? Why did you leave? You know what what's going on that you are uh, feeling the need to talk about now? That's what a real journalist would do. That's what someone that was actually interested in the truth and actually interested in the third party movement success would do. Uh, but instead, ignore her. Uh, the the People's Party has all but smeared her as a CIA agent with no with no evidence whatsoever. Same as everyone else, they've smeared as an asset. Uh, so I just I just find this totally distasteful and quite frankly just disgusting. Yeah, well, this is multi layered, right? So it's like people are people like to nitpick and they'll be like, "There's no evidence that the accuser is coming in like good faith." And it's like, okay, one, I don't believe that's true, but let's set that let's table that aside and look at every other piece of like leadership malpractice that Nick Brana has uh, participated in. Uh, we're talking about going back to the original days of calling the uh, you know petitioners like operatives and like. Uh, you know, uh, uh, like like just smearing them relentlessly, like calling them all kinds of names, like saying they're infiltrators with no evidence, like all kinds of stuff, like saying that they just wanted to bring the party down. So that's that that's the original reporting that the Vanguard did way back in the day. Uh, kind of created our little bit of a feud with the uh, a movement for a People's Party. But at that time, we were kind of like, well, if they booted Nick Branagh, uh, got their shit together, probably get down with it. But uh, we had this little uh, image that we made. It was like King Nick Branagh, and we called it a People's Corporation. Really rings true now, actually. Uh, when you think about how it's been run, he like unilaterally uh, got together with his daddy and kicked everybody off the board that disagreed with him, that wanted him to have to, like, you know, uh, be held the consequence for his actions uh all kinds of sus looking shit like that uh he then lied multiple times uh as was documented really well by jordan Cheriton's reporting over at status Q. you guys can take a look at that if you want to see some really ironclad like bullet by bullet by bullet reporting uh jordan Cheriton, uh whether you disagree with some of his political takes hey sometimes i disagree with his political takes uh he's a honest to god thorough reporter uh and when he comes out with reporting you can rely on it 100 percent uh and he did a systematic breakdown of this most recent a uh, bit of uh, unto-do behavior, if you want to call it the most gentle thing possible. Basically, uh, the corruption behind the scenes at the People's Party, not just the wasting of the money, yada, yada, yada. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, uh, again, it's like, yes, Jimmy Dore should have called this out way sooner. Uh, Paula herself should have called this out way sooner. And Jackson Hinkle doesn't have a goddamn original thought in his brain, so he just reads his lines after he's watched the Jimmy Dore show. Yeah, exactly. Um, and thank you for the super chat, Estev08, uh, for the 499. Really appreciate the donation. How long until Jimmy Dore starts calling Paula Jean a CIA asset? Well, so far, he's just completely ignoring Paula Jean's testimony on this issue, uh, just completely sweeping it under the rug, pretending like it doesn't exist because it doesn't fit his narrative. Um, but the People's Party itself has essentially all but labeled Paula Jean uh, an asset with obviously no evidence every time anyone comes out uh to to uh, you know wave the red flag to explain what's happening behind the scenes of the people's party they're instantly labeled an asset or an infiltrator with no evidence whatsoever and again it's like why, why would the cia even be wasting resources on infiltrating the people's party an organization which clearly has no actual threat to the Democratic Party or to the establishment. They're not running any candidates. They're clearly never going to. Uh, I'm sorry, but the People's Party is not actually a threat to the establishment. If anything, the People's Party is good for the establishment because it's it's taking away donation. It's taking away time and energy from the Green Party, from other serious third party efforts, which actually are challenging the establishment. Uh, the People's Party is literally helping the Democrats. It's helping uh, the duopoly because it makes the third party movement look so bad. So why would the CIA be infiltrating and trying to, you know, trying to fuck with the People's Party when the People's Party is literally already doing their job for them of making the third party movement look like shit and producing absolutely no results? It's literally sucking time, energy, donations out of what could be an actual robust third party movement uh, and diverting the left. Uh, it's it's splintering the left into more and more factions as it is. So, again, they don't need to infiltrate it. It's already it's already you know doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do. Uh, anyway, thank you for the super chat. And we got another couple super chats as well. Thank you, Anthony, for the two bucks. Is Mitt Romney calling Tulsi a traitor slander? 
Um, I mean, I, I don't know if legally it would consi be considered slander, but I do think it's, you know, pretty ridiculous. All of these, uh, all these, you know, people like Mitt Romney and the folks on The View saying that, like, we should, uh, that Tulsi Gabbard should be, like, you know, invested by the federal government or whatever. Like, I think The View where they were saying, like, they should arrest Tucker Carlson or something crazy for, you know, not, not towing this. For treason, yeah. It was yeah, for treason. So, you know, I, I don't know if it legally would be considered slander, but it is stupid. There's no doubt about that. Anyway, thanks for the super chat. Oh, uh, really quickly, I'll just harp on that for a second. We talked about this the other day, the legal definition in the tooth of, a, like, a term slander. Like, of course, if you read it broadly, right, slander is the action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation by that definition of course uh but because of cable news companies and people uh uh who ran the tabloids back in the day and all this kind of shit it's like impossible to get somebody uh uh in court uh for slander even if they did slander you otherwise donald trump would have like 10 million fucking lawsuits and uh all kinds of shit like that right um and also basically every news publication would be out of business and oh the only time that you can that uh, we've ever seen and i talk about this too much on the show uh was when uh like the Gawker published the nudes of uh, Hulk Hogan and then he had the billion dollar bankroll of Peter Thiel to put them out and that was how he got them. But it's very rare that somebody's able to successfully win a slander lawsuit. Right. That is very correct. And that's how it should be, by the way. Um, but thank you, by the way, Anthony, for the two bucks. And also thank you, John, for the five bucks. Why don't you guys have her on? I'm confused. I hope I didn't waste my super chat. LOL. Why are we assuming Jimmy didn't reach out to Paula? Well, we have invited Paula Jean Swearingen on and I'll publicly invite her right now. Paula, if you're listening, we would love to talk to you on the Vanguard uh, to discuss your experience with the People's Party and what you plan to do next as far as your um, career in this movement goes. Uh, so, you know, that goes without saying. We would love to chat with Paula Jean Swearingen. Uh, why am I assuming Jimmy didn't reach out to her? Because when Jimmy Dore had Nick Brana on his show after Paula Jean Swearingen publicly left the People's Party, he didn't even bring it up once. In that entire, like, 30-minute interview, he literally didn't bring up Paula Jean Swearingen once. He didn't ask Nick Brana, hey, what's up with this? My supposed friend of the show publicly leaving, publicly explaining what's going on here uh is this something we should be worried about nope didn't get any of that from jimmy door he completely ignored it uh so that's why i'm gonna assume that uh you know as he usually does he's not gonna invite anyone on that dissents that doesn't you know agree with his narrative or the way he sees things uh i mean that's just my opinion it's possible he has but i highly doubt it yeah no uh, and all i'll add is that we've 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 asked Paula Jean Swearingen on our show at multiple stages in her career. So it's not that we don't want to talk to her. I, I think that maybe our show just, you know, we, we're a certain kind of show. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and I understand, you know, if Paula Jean or, or anybody else uh, looks at the kind of, that's what know, I mean. Yeah. The kind of, you know, clickbaity drama content that we often traffic in and says, you know, maybe I'll, I'll go on a, a more uh, serious presenting platform. Totally understandable. Obviously, I don't hold it against her or anyone else. Uh, but thank you also, Nick, for the $4.99. Jimmy is an effective and entertaining communicator, which is incredibly valuable. Paula and you dudes have every right to call him out in this case. Well, thank you, Nick, for being reasonable here. And, and I totally agree. J Jimmy Dore is an effective and entertaining communicator. It's why he just hit a million subs on YouTube. There's obviously no denying that. Um, you know, and when he's right, he's on fire. I, I love his commentary. You know, in the past, I used to be a huge Jimmy Dore fan. And, and again, on the issues where I still agree with him, I still enjoy his content as much as I do anyone else who I have significant disagreements with. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're, you're correct in, in saying that. And, and like I said, I still give the guy credit where I think it's due. Um, but, you know, more and more so lately, uh, less and less of those opportunities come our way. And with this whole People's Party disaster, it's it's fair to say that, you know, it's just it's hard to look at this and, and be anything other than, you know, uh, offended. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, uh, I, I've always like I was just talking about this a few days ago on the stream. Like we've always defended Jimmy's right to fucking express himself however he wants. And I always thought it was horseshit for people to be like, oh, he's so angry and oh, he's so loud and mean and caustic and i'm like well i can be loud and mean and caustic who am i to call somebody else for that i think the world's mean and loud and caustic too uh so you know you have every right to greet the world without the world greets you that's no big deal to me uh i started to diverge from jimmy one when i thought that his show started to get extremely boomery and not like uh, very entertaining for me to watch anymore um and also i thought his takes took a nosedive uh for a little bit so yeah, but of I, I think that Gavin's 100% correct. There's no way he would have gotten where he's gotten if he wasn't an uh, effective communicator and an entertaining one at that. So, you know, I, I no disagreement with you, really, Nick. Yeah, 100%. And and again, thanks for... Re uh, and I think you I think you uh, honestly speak for uh, a lot of Jimmy's audience. You know, I, I've looked at the comment sections on a lot of Jimmy's videos. When he was interviewing Nick Braun alive, I remember the chat was just like, 
completely dumbfounded by the way he conducted the interview. I even posted a tweet about it saying that, you know, Jimmy Dort's chat is just not having this interview. And a lot of them were like, hey, dude, why are you what's with the softballs? Uh, the People's Party is clearly collapsing. We deserve a real hardball interview from you. Uh, and, and that's again, that's another reason why I'm so upset about all this It's like, Jimmy Dore's audience deserves a hardball interview with Nick Brana. They deserve for Jimmy to grill him and be like, hey, you've been, you know, soliciting donations from my audience. A lot of these people are, you know, sussed out by the People's Party. They're getting some really sketchy vibes. Can uh, at least doing a hardball interview would be the very least Jimmy Dore uh, owes his audience. And he refuses to even do that. He just does literal propaganda for the People's Party, um, which is what he always, you know, accuses other people of doing for the Democrats. It's the same exact shit, just for a different party. So, uh, and again, a party that literally has no results to show for itself either. So it, it, equally or even more embarrassing as a result. Um, anyway, thank you, Pedro the Lion, also for the, the 369, more depressing Rokana or People's Party. I mean, God, they're both so depressing, right? That, that's the issue here is like, on one hand, the the Justice Democrat squad thing is, is just such a failure, obviously, such a complete and utter disappointment and waste of time, energy and resources, as we've talked about at length. Um, but then on the other hand, the purported solution to it, as proposed by folks like Jimmy Dore, is just this flailing, toxic grift of an organization. So obviously, I'm not going to invest in that either. Uh, what Zach and I have come to the conclusion of is just, you know, we're going to support the Green Party when they're running good candidates and they actually are running candidates. Unlike the MPP, their platform is, in my opinion, far superior to the People's Party, It's far more serious. Um, so, you know, I, I consider myself a Green, but, you know, they have flaws, too, of course. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just open to whatever the best option is when the time comes to vote, ultimately. But yeah, it's it's depressing. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I didn't, I was never like a hardcore bro guy, so this is going to inform my. Uh, so I never thought that he was going to save the Democratic Party, and I never even had him in part of my like squad brain when I was thinking about it. Like he was always like, oh yeah, plus Rokana, sometimes he does good shit, but he would always be like, oh, I'm a capitalist. I actually believe in all this shit. I'm like, oh okay, well then when the revolution comes, we know what team you're on. Um, so that's fine, right? Uh, he didn't even give any of that Bernie Sanders wordplay. I believe in democratic socialism. Okay, well, what does that mean, bro? Do you want workers to have the fucking means of production or not, Bernie? But anyway, uh, so People's Party, I had a lot of hope for it, man, because I was so fucking tired and done and pissed off about Bernie Sanders' revo revolution. Uh, you know, as people have pointed out correctly, it was a revolution in marketing only. But, um, you know, I was pissed. I was ready for something different, as there were so many people that were stoked and excited about the People's Party. And I think that's why they were able to get such a fucking uh, insane lineup for that uh, People's Party uh, convention, right? They had everybody from, like, Cornell West to um, Nina Turner uh, to uh, Chris Hedges spoke. I mean, all kinds of people spoke at that big convention. We reacted to it. It was amazing. Um, so I think that I think that uh, we all wanted that. I think there was a big energy for that. And, and it, it felt like there was a vacuum because we'd all just felt such connection and such uh, uh, like a purpose together because of the Bernie Sanders campaign. And when that all fell apart and we had that illusion shattered for us all, we wanted to have something tangible to get onto. Right. And that's what laid everybody perfectly into Nick Brandon's trap. Right. Uh, so that's a fucked up reality. And, and that's why I think it's a little bit of a harder L uh, for the people's party. Right. Like I've always known Rokana's wife was rich as shit. And that's where his heart really lies. Yeah, that's totally fair. Thanks for the super chat, Pedro. The lion, really appreciate it. Um, let's get into this next super chat. Thank you, Will, for the five bucks. Saw Jimmy live a few months ago. Good show. It ended with the chant, no more wars. Makes sense now. I mean, that's that's great. I'm glad you had a good time. And obviously, yeah, uh, Jimmy Dore's, you know, hardline anti-war stance is something that I think he's totally correct about. So He's also shitting on the cops this morning, which I appreciated. There you go. Yeah, I mean, sometimes he definitely can still deliver some quality content or comedy or whatever um but yeah this is just so disappointing and i think paula jean swearingen ha has every right to express her her uh frustration with the situation because again she put her entire credibility in with this organization her entire you know clout with the with the left movement um only for to be completely disappointed so you know thanks for the super chat really appreciate that uh and jimmy Dore is actually coming to kansas city but the tickets are like fucking 50 dollars, so i don't think we're probably gonna go <laughs> considered it but i was like eh probably get like assaulted by his you know rabid fans They're like fuck you grift guard that'd be hilarious that would make it worth going we'd have to but you know anyway i don't think it would be that bad 
<laughs> we just get stoned. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, not stoned like with weed. I mean, like people throwing rocks at us. Uh, but yeah, thank you also, Tool Droid, for the 1499. Did Jimmy ever address Tulsi's complete descent into normie Republican madness? Seems like a big deal to just gloss over after fawning over her for the last six years. Um, no, he never did. He never addressed that. No, of course he didn't. Uh, just like with the People's Party, um, he, he'll promote something you know, for months on end, uh, encourage his viewers to donate. Um, and, and by the way, the funny thing is that Tulsi was running as a Democrat too. He pretends like, oh, I, I have a principled stance against, you know, voting for donating to Democrats unless you're Tulsi Gabbard, like what the fuck? And then she endorsed Joe Biden too. Uh, and of course we never got any sort of retraction on that front from Jimmy. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's completely freaking crazy. Uh, and I would just have so much more respect for him if he was just like, Hey, you know, didn't turn out the way I was hoping uh, with the People's Party. Didn't help turn out the way I was hoping with Tulsi. Uh, you know, obviously I was doing my best calling this, but I was wrong. Um, but nope, we're never going to get a retraction or any sort of like apology uh, as far as that goes. Um, and, and yeah, obviously, you know, Tulsi's descent into, as you said, uh, normie Republican madness has been quite the spectacle to behold. Very disappointing as someone who used to, you know, have somewhat mild uh, positive feelings about Tulsi. So, yeah, just. You know, it's, a, it's the same exact thing. And for anybody who wants to be like, Dulce is not a mainstream Republican. What are you talking about? Reaganomics? Are you going to simp for Reaganomics? What she was talking about creating a culture of dependency? With a straight up from 80s conservatism, guys. Tulsi's on the road to serfdom. Okay? That's all I'm saying. Uh, that was, you know, whatever. And also, do you remember all that, like, just blatant, hysterical Islamophobia? Like, Tucker brings her on uh, to swat down um you know biden for with uh the drone strikes that killed the uh, innocent children remember that when we were pulling out of afghanistan and then she's like no we need more drone strikes we need to kill more children and innocent civilians like what are you talking about people try and say she's anti-war no she's not she's anti uh troops on the ground interventionism she's completely fine with running the world from drone strikes as she's made clear she literally tweeted a picture of herself from like fucking in the middle of africa being like working on an operation and to which abby martin quote or empire files or somebody quote tweeted and was like translation i've been killing brown people in africa like yeah that's what the u.s government does guys and that's why uh, that's why i'm sus about anybody that's still in the u.s military that's trying to call themselves a leftist like if you were previously in the military okay and then you were you you're no longer paid by them okay but don't yeah you're still in it you're still telling people to rec go out there kill brown people do all this fucked up shit that our military does like no can't trust you yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyone that still supports Tulsi Gabbard or Defensor is totally, you know, cringe in my book. Uh, looking at you, dumb fuck convo couch losers. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks for the super chat tool, Drew. I'd really appreciate that. Um, yeah, agreed. And thank you also, Joe Sheree, for the two bucks. Thank you for standing by us. Vanguard, uh, another corn commie here, Joe Sheree from uh, the great state of Kansas, where Zach and I grew up. Um, thank you so much, Joe. We had you on the uh, podcast, you know, originally when we talked about the implosion of MPP. She was one of the uh, the volunteers which were expressing major grievances, and we gave her a platform to speak. Uh, but thank you so much for the two bucks. Thank you also, Levon, Levin Huey, for the 499. It's disappointing to see you two seemingly celebrate the downfall of a potential third party. We need to have as many voting options available. Oh, I'm not celebrating anything, Levon. Trust me. Uh, it's it's very uh, disappointing for me as well to watch the downfall of this because, like I said, think about how the money, the time, the energy gets sucked out of uh, what could be an actually robust third party movement. You know, if all the resources, time, and energy, volunteering that went into the People's Party had gone towards a worthy third party cause, um, then that would be amazing. That would be exactly what we need. And that's why originally I was a big supporter of MPP. If uh, we've talked about it a million times, but at the beginning of this channel's history, Zach and I made a myriad of pro. MPP videos, um, which is why now that the tables have turned and new evidence has come to light, we feel the responsibility to report on that uh, and share the truth of what's going on. So it's not a celebration. I mean, yeah, we like to get a little bit spicy and, you know, we were right, etc. But no, it's not a celebration. Obviously, I don't celebrate the downfall of a potential third party. We're just, you know, pointing out what's going on in the style that we talk about everything else. Yeah, hundred percent. Look, and and if any if the, if anything that we're celebrating, we're celebrating the fact that you guys fucking know about this now because we've been telling everybody that this has not been the way for a long time. And yeah, Gavin made the point that it's actually better now that everybody does know that this was a complete fraud because at least we can now start building forward 
uh, we can start doing it better because, you know, what's what's the use of a third party that sucks up everybody's money, interest, and then doesn't deliver anything? So that's why I'm happy that that's been exposed now. So we can uh, start uh, having serious conversations where actual uh, progress can be made. And, you know, whether that takes the shape in the Green Party or the Ham Sandwich Party or the I Don't Give a Fuck Party, um, we need something that's not the People's Party because, uh, you know, uh, if anything, it wasn't democratic. It was literally explicitly not democratic. It was a corporation, uh, essentially. Yeah, we got to start the Vanguard Party. Yeah. Who wants to run as the Vanguard Party candidate? Yeah. Step up. Literally nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We got a few. We got a few super fans. <laughs> Mad Ocelot God, where you at? No, I'm just kidding. But thank you, uh, Levon Huey, for the 499. Really appreciate that. Thank you also, Anthony, for the five bucks. Um, does the recent uh ijc case concerning russia and ukraine officially rule the war as a crime what are your thoughts on the u.s and war crimes well that's a pretty broad question uh i'm do you know what he's what he's referring to with the ijc case zach uh, doesn't look like he does um uh, either mind. joint commission is the ijc uh it is uh it's the uh, responsible blah, 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 blah. Hundreds of blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I, I have no idea, but I imagine, I get the gist of what you're saying here. Uh, you know, does this officially rule it as like a war crime? Like, uh, I'm sure that every war, like, I, it's such a weird s question, like, right? Because you have to agree to this premise that like war cannot be criminal uh, also. Uh, so like, obviously we point out war crimes because the United States is doing such egregious shit all the time uh, that we have to be like, look guys, even by your own standards, this is fucked up. Um, so look, uh, I haven't, I, I can't say for sure. Like if I look by, according to the IJC, uh, is what's happening with the Russia, uh, invasion and attack on Ukraine. Like have they, you know, done war crimes? I did see that Russia bombed a hospital. Like technically that's a war crime, right? Like, okay. Uh, it has the United States done war crimes. You fucking bet your ass. We do war crimes all the time whenever it's beneficial to us. That's why we have all these laws in place. That's like, we'll go to war with the whole world. If you try and indict us under the Geneva convention and shit like that, you know what I mean? Um, <coughs> So, um, the U.S. has no. That's the that's the thing that we always fall back on. It's like, of course, Russia is not doing great things when they attack Ukraine. Ukraine's not doing good things when they bomb uh, their own civilians that are uh, in you know Donetsk and uh, you know the separatist ultranationalist regions, right, or whatever the fuck you want to call them, right. I don't fucking. Uh, I'm not an expert, right. But there's that's clearly where the conflict is. It's the ultranationalists versus the fucking uh, separatists, right. Uh, or, you know. Okay. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, both sides have committed war crimes, no doubt about it. Anyone saying otherwise is dumb as fuck. Obviously, any war is by its very nature criminal, essentially. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know who would argue with that. Uh, but yeah, obviously, the U.S. has committed more war crimes, which gives us no moral authority, no moral high ground on which to stand on and sanction the shit out of the Russian economy and basically destroy the livelihoods of normal working class Russian people. So that's that's my stance. But you know, appreciate your comment, Anthony. Really, genuinely do. Uh, and do we have anything else to say about the People's Party, Nick Brana, et cetera? Uh, no, I think that we've just about beat this fucking horse to death. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, that's essentially what we think about this issue. We've been covering it for a long time. We'll see how it evolves, if it does, or if it just kind of goes in the wind. Yeah, 100%. Uh, thanks, everyone, for bearing with us in the latest chapter of MPP Drama. We do have another dramatic story to get to. Might as well dive right into the Vosh shit, right? We were talking a little bit about Vosh um, on our channel the other day and the controversy he's been embroiled in uh, as it relates to J.K. Rowling and ContraPoints also, who blocked Vosh after a bit of a Twitter exchange the other day. This obviously comes as a surprise because Vosh and Contra had been um, very close or not very close, but they were at least, you know, friendly. Um, Contra had been on Vosh's stream a multiple amount of times. Um, you know, they were, they were basically homies. So, you know, it was definitely a bit shocking to see her just straight up block his ass uh, after a, you know, pretty civil exchange on Twitter. It's not like he was calling her names or anything. It seemed, you know, basic Vosh kind of discourse to me, but uh, anyway, she blocked him. Um, but Vosh then came back and shared this video, Contra's own words, Natalie Wynn's own words. Uh, and I think that he honestly kind of got her, guys. I think he kind of exposed her hypocrisy on this whole issue of canceling people over off-color comments or offensive jokes, edgy jokes, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and I do want to do a bit of a deep dive into this because I know we got some dissent even from our own 
audience as far as the merits of his joke and as far as the merits of edgy, you know, shit posting kind of humor in the first place. So, you know, I want to I want to make sure that our position on this is clear and that no one uh, that no one misunderstands where we're coming at this from. Um, but before we get into all that, I do want to play this because, again, Vosh is basically pointing out Natalie's hypocrisy on this issue. Um, let's take a look here. Here, one sec. Let me turn up the volume. Sorry about that. You try to explain or defend yourself. I mean, first of all, you almost certainly dig yourself in deeper. But even if you're articulate and correct, you'll still be seen as unable to take criticism and as ignoring the hurt of marginalized people. You try to explain or defend yourself. I mean, first of all, you almost certainly dig yourself in deeper. But even if you're articulate and correct, you'll still be seen as unable to take criticism and as ignoring the hurt of marginalized people. Okay, that's I actually had I I, I saw a different uh, clip that he put out. Uh, I forgot about this one. This is damning. This is pretty damning. This is this is because it, it almost shows the fact that it's kind of like what I said the other day. It feels like ContraPoints is almost being like a caricature of herself when she like gets super triggered about this because like the whole point of her channel was like let's focus on the substance of these arguments and not just get triggered on the internet. Right, hundred percent. So yeah, I mean I, again. Contrapoints, I was a little bit disappointed in her take on this issue. And as I've said, you know, I'm trying to find Vosh's joke, uh, the original joke in the first place. So just in case anyone's not caught up with the situation. So let me find that real quick, Zach, and give some commentary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially what he says is, uh, you know, women sit down and shut up challenge or whatever the fuck it was. It was some bastardized version of that. Gavin will find it. So we have the receipts. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I just feel like this is one of those issues where it's like... <laughs> Of all things to just unilaterally critique Vosh for, of which I think that there are an astounding number of political uh, takes that he has that are just dog shit, right? That, that are just rooted in like a bad take. Uh, we've made about probably 50 to 100 videos in Van no, maybe not that many, but maybe at least 25 videos about Vosh's dog shit po foreign policy takes about how he he wants to solve problems with NATO, that he, you know, he wanted to send a shit ton of US weapons to. Uh, Ukraine so that they could, quote, kill as many Russians as they possibly could as they went over the uh, border. All kinds of shit that I just thought were bad incendiary takes. He had a horrible, horrible take on force the vote, if you want to dredge up that old uh, lefty debate. Uh, he's simped for the squad in a way that I just think is so ridiculous. Uh, at this point, he wanted everybody to vote for Joe Biden, uh, which a uh, bad take hasn't aged well. He's not, you know, updated his position on that. All kinds of things, right? So there's obviously massive, massive room to criticize Bosch. And I actually feel uncomfortable that I found myself on Coconut Island for a little bit, having to defend him, uh, because I just don't think that it's a good look for the left uh, to melt down over what's an obvious sarcastic tweet with really good intentions and try and pretend like this dude is some like traitor to the left that needs to be ostracized for an outsized from YouTube. Like, no, what the fuck? Like people be like, he has no home on bread tube anymore after this like ridiculousness. And it's just like, everybody needs to settle down. If he has no home on bread tube, it's for a whole host of other reasons that I'd be happy to lay out for you. But it's not because of a dumb tweet that he made about JK Rowling that every time I've objectively shown it to somebody that doesn't work in YouTube world, they laugh. Yeah, exactly. And again, uh, we got a little bit of pushback on our last video where we broke this down and people were like, you know, misogyny is not excusable, you know, if it's a joke. Like, misogyny under no you know, circumstance is funny. There's no excuse for jokes that are problematic, et cetera. And, and again, I, I'm not, I don't want to be condescending here because I don't, I can't tell how many of you guys just don't understand the joke versus how many of you guys are uncharitably interpreting, interpreting it just so you can dunk on Vosh or whatever. Um, again, I don't know. A lot of people seem to genuinely not understand this joke that Vosh made. So here's the, here's the, here's the original joke. Let's break it down once again. Vosh says, all J.K. Rowling had to do was shut the fuck up and she could have been almost uncritically beloved for like a century. And obviously that is very true. If, if J.K. Rowling had decided to not become the highest profile transphobe in the world, then yeah, she would have been almost uncritically beloved for like a century. It's gotten to the point where even people like Emma Watson and Daniel Radcliffe constantly are, you know, subtly disassociating themselves with her. They're, you know distancing himself from her because she's so toxic and such an obvious bigot um 
So again, the first tweet, 100% correct. The second tweet is where things got spicy and a lot of people took issue, of course, including J.K. Rowling herself. Vosh said, women be quieter and start apologizing challenge. The point of this joke is not that sexism is funny. That's not the punchline. That's not the point. The joke is that this here, the second tweet, is like the most uncharitable possible interpretation of the first tweet. So if you look at this first tweet, he says, all J.K. Rowling had to do was shut the fuck up and she could have been beloved for a century. Uh, someone like J.K. Rowling that uncharitably is looking at this would say, oh, so you're basically saying I should just shut up and be quiet, right? Obviously, that's not really the point. Vosh wasn't just saying, you know, women should be quiet. Women should be quiet and start apologizing. So that's the point of the fucking joke, that this here is the most uncharitable interpretation of the top joke. This is obvious to me. It was from the minute I saw it. Um, literally just, you know, easy, done. Okay, whatever. Shit post, edgy joke. Let's move on. Um, but now everyone is pearl clutching, fucking virtue signaling, acting like, oh, oh, how dare you make an off-color joke that's slightly edgy, that's slightly offensive. Like, no, he, the, do you actually think that this is something that Vosh believes? Do you actually think that this is like, and, and again, we don't even defend Vosh. We barely like the guy. I, I disagree with him more often than not. But still, out of principle, I'm going to defend people's right to make edgy jokes and just to demonstrate we're going to do a little bit of a, a classroom time it's time to uh professor gavin to put on his glasses i just last night when i was scrolling my twitter i screenshotted four edgy jokes that i saw just to give you guys an example of what an edgy joke looks like uh and and why obviously they're jokes so okay let's look at this one john lennon was weak as fuck just catch the bullet with your hand and throw it back <laughs> Obviously, the point of this joke is not that murder is funny or the person's not actually saying that John Lennon was weak as fuck. It's an edgy shitpost joke, and it's funny. Just laugh and move on. It's the same exact thing that Vosh did. Here's another one. This person says, sometimes I gag on the toothbrush and start to feel like a little whore. On its face, you might say, this is really sexist. How offensive. Obviously, the joke is not, oh, women are whores. It's not the fucking point. It's an edgy joke. Here's another one. I think raising it. male whores, Gavin. <laughs> yeah. Here's another one from the same account. This is a good uh, shit post account. If a man bakes a pie and you eat it, you are gay. You are kissing and touching men. Fuck. So obviously, this person is not actually homophobic. This person is not actually trying to espouse a homophobic sentiment. The, that's the, the homophobia is the joke. He's pointing out how stupid homophobia is. Let's move on to one more. Here's one that I'm sure all of you guys on the left will recognize and appreciate, and I'm sure you understand it in this content, context. Do this with your favorite bourgeois. They are in the guillotine. Uh, lefties, myself included, love to make guillotine jokes. Any normie could say, wow. They could take one of these out of context and say, oh, wow, look at the left. They're in favor of murder. They're joking about capital punishment and killing people who they disagree with politically. Is it the most productive thing ever to make guillotine jokes? Maybe not. But guess what? Jokes don't have to be fucking productive. They're jokes. They don't have to always further the cause of the political movement that you you know, are embracing. Sometimes they just need to be funny. Sometimes they're just jokes. So again, in the same way that this, this Twitter user is not actually saying, I mean, maybe they are, but in my opinion, probably not actually saying that, oh, I support murder or murder is hilarious. Uh, no, obviously it's a fucking joke. In the same way that what Vosh said was ironic, it was an edgy shit post, and it should not be taken so goddamn seriously by all you pearl clutching fucking losers out there. And that's another thing about this. Like, I'm pretty goddamn woke, guys. I'm, you know, on the as far left as you can get on pretty much every social position. But I will not fucking abide the pearl clutching. I will not fucking abide this dumb, annoying virtue signaling, just not just because it's fucking annoying, but because it makes the whole entire left look like shit. It makes us look like a bunch of people that can't take a goddamn joke and then have to get triggered and start hand wringing every time anyone says something that's slightly off color. It's so goddamn annoying. Yeah, it, it's exactly what we were talking about with Ben Burgess the other day. Like when Ben Burgess went on Joe Rogan, a bunch of fucking liberals got pissed off that he didn't just like fucking flail his hands and get all triggered and, you know, you know, raise points of personal privilege and, you know, all kinds of shit like that that create a caricature and a mockery of the left. You want to know why? Those people don't want the actual left to succeed. They want us to be just these societal outcasts, mocked, whatever. So what you have to understand is that 100% 
none of us, including Vosh, by the way, in this particular instance, would ever waver on our commitment to like, you know, trans solidarity, LGBTQ solidarity uh, when it comes to the meat and potatoes of this. But getting triggered out of some like faux righteousness, it's, it's not helpful to anybody. It's the same people that get fucking worked up and, and pretend to care about uh, anything. Uh, and, and then when the meat and potatoes come down to it, it's like, oh, well, that's not like the spicy thing to get worked up about today. So, you know, it's not actually that interesting. And it also just makes anybody else who would be sympathetic to our ideas. Right. Like, you know, uh, most people that you talk about fucking, you know, if you, if you put a gun to your head, hey, man, you know, bathroom laws, that's that's pretty fucked up. Like, you know, depending on who you're talking to. Right. People who are our age, when I talk to them. Most people don't give a shit, right? They just don't. We even live in Kansas City, Missouri, right? Which I feel like is a skewed demographic. But when I talk to people who are mostly our age about that, they don't give a fuck. I understand that changes dramatically as the, the demographic aged. If I was talking to like 45-year-old men in Kansas City, I have probably a whole different response. But uh, I, I just think that um, it's easy for those people to like pearl clutch and get, you know, fucking uh, mad about this. But it's like at the crux of it, what was happening? He was exposing the fact, and I think we actually got a super chat that laid this out. It disappeared for me. But he was exposing the fact that J.K. Rawlings doesn't actually view trans women as women, right? And, and again, Gavin, you made the perfect point that these tweets were not, like, independent of each other. It wasn't like he tweeted this one day, and then, like, six weeks later, he tweets at J.K. Rowling this other tweet that's, like, way, like, oh, you need to be quiet and whatever. Like, no, he was replying to his original tweet making another joke it was a follow-up joke it was like i uh exactly like you said like a disingenuous translation and he was beating her to the punch on it that's what made me laugh that's why i thought it was funny like everybody's like oh these two bros think misogyny is so funny like no i actually think a well-crafted one-two punch that apparently outsmarted a lot of people on the internet was pretty funny right like no she was walking into his trap like by like yeah he of course he was going to say that so anyway i'll read your super chat just Binia. thank you so much for the ten dollar donation uh the point of the joke is that jkr doesn't think trans women are women exactly and she silences them all the time the joke is Vosh treating jkr like she treats trans women bingo yeah it's not just like, oh misogyny's funny bro no it was just a joke that was like showing how ridiculous on its face J.K. Rowling's uh, caricature of the trans community and the trans experience is. She always, always, always does the thing where she'll immediately talk about, like, oh, look at this one instance where, like, a, you know, a, a person at a battered women's shelter was, like, you know, assaulted by a person who identified as transgender. And then it's, like, ignoring the mountains of data that, like, actually trans women are the most <laughs> likely victims of both sexual and domestic abuse in the entire fucking world. Um, but anyway, I digress. 100%. And thank you so much for the super chat. Just been, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, and thank you also, Jack, for the five bucks. Absolutely love this take. Professor Gavin is truly based. Thank you very much. I'm an accredited professor. To get you a white coat. <laughs> exactly <laughs> but yeah thank you so much jack really appreciate it. glad you liked my little lecture for the pearl clutchers in our audience the fucking virtue signalers jesus christ it's fucking annoying as shit uh again if you've ever laughed at a, a guillotine joke then you have no right to pearl clutch over this you have no right to virtue signal and also it's like uh, yeah anyway we we don't have to keep going down this hill but uh the only other the only other note that i'll add because i do think this is the one legitimate criticism of vosh is that he has treated other people in the same way that he's now decrying the treatment of himself. Um, so, you know, I think he once published a video talking about like why, why South Park is not actually funny because it's just like, it's just uh, mean, you know, bigoted jokes described as comedy. Um, and there's a, you know, a couple other examples of that too, where he doesn't give other people making edgy jokes, the same charitability that he now once from people when he makes an edgy joke so i do think that's fair to point out his hypocrisy yes yeah, sometimes he likes to take the moral high ground and be like oh this is not funny you're being problematic uh but then when it's his time in the hot seat he's like uh you know it was just a joke calm down so you know there is some hypocrisy there that being said i have a principle 
when it comes to defending people and their right to make edgy shit posting jokes and i'm gonna you know defend that principle regardless of the subject's hypocrisy if you get what i mean yeah and look the other thing that i'll have to say is like you know people are making this point in the comment section and i like i see where people are coming from it's like if you want to consistently critique how vosh behaves like unilaterally across the board you think that every single thing that vosh does because we talk about this all the time like he's really aggro about a lot of things like he just gets mad and worked up and debate bro and that's how he built his entire channel and that's what like half a million people want to watch right um you know if you think that's just all bad for the left you know you hate that shit you know i can understand you think all shit posting is bad uh that's a logically consistent means of critiquing uh vosh you know i disagree with it but i like i'm not gonna say that it's like illogical like if you think that you know the left should all be this like super sanitized uh holier than now moral body uh and completely unrelatable to anybody else uh then then you know, I guess that is logically consistent, right? But if you've ever been on the internet and you know the people we need to reach, we need to do two things. We need to, one, not sacrifice our solidarity with the uh, marginalized communities that the left is always in solidarity with, right? We don't need to get into this again, but it's the bedrock of the vanguard. You guys can, you know, obviously understand that. But we also don't need to become caricatures of social justice warriors, right? Like, as Gavin pointed out, like, hello, we like jokes, we think we're funny. I don't like jokes that are like intentionally mean and making fun of like people who are defenseless and like fucking marginalized. Like obviously there are lines that can be crossed, right? But for the most part, like if the joke is making a point that I think is funny or like the joke, like it's all about like intent, right? Like we talk about that in comedy a lot. Like wh who is the punchline actually about a, a lot of times, you know, uh, that sort of thing. And people have different understandings and takes and uh, thresholds for that. And I get that and all that shit. So I don't want people to think that just like, oh, you disagree with us on this take? Like, I don't think you're like crazy. I just think you need to apply that principle all the way across the board and then see where that gets you. And if you don't like that principle, then maybe you might want to update your position on this. Yeah, and also if you've ever laughed at Michael Scott in the office, then guess what? You laughed at an edgy joke that had some bigotry involved. So get the fuck over yourself. The most watched tv show yeah exactly literally the most watched tv show if you ever laughed at an episode of the office then you have no right to stand there and oh this is so offensive shut the fuck up get the fuck over yourself anyway it's probably the end of our vosh segment for today um, but we do have some more news to discuss if you can believe it it's a friday once if again. you can believe it anyway uh what do you want to talk about next zach i know we have a couple more topics to go over uh let's interlude with charlie kirk and his dog shit take and then we can get into the glenn shit good ass call so i thought this was pretty Sir crazy switch also just came in with his worst take of all time i'm sorry sir switch i've never wanted to mute somebody in our chat before if, if i believed in that i i would have done it a long ago but wow this is the first tweet that or a tweet this is the first comment that chat that ever made me want to fucking mute somebody banned perma ban instant ban yeah no i actually am a huge fan of the office um and i i, I avoided watching it for years because i thought it would be overrated um, but then I actually watch it and it's like, it's just undeniably a hilarious, amazing show. Um, so that's a normie take. Obviously it's not a fucking unpopular opinion to say like the office is good, uh, but it is, it is. And like in a way that parks and rec, for example, is not like, I don't think parks and rec is even close to being anywhere near as good as the office. Like it just pales in comparison on almost every Chris possible. Yeah. Chris life. Pratt's annoying, but even if you put him aside, um, it's just the humor is not as good. The character writing isn't as good. The Office is good in a way that very few modern sitcoms are. Uh, in fact, it is the defining sitcom of Zach and I's generation, in my opinion. Uh, and that is a hill I will die on. So anyway, uh, thanks for this. I guess it's not a super chat. Thanks for this. <laughs> yeah, that was just me getting triggered by a random comment. I had to leech onto it. I was like, oh, no, I have to fight about this. No, I'm kidding. I was pearl clutching. Yeah, you fucking virtue signaler. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, let's let's get into this. You want to see some actual pearl clutching, some actual fucking lunacy. Let's take a look at none other than dumb motherfucker Charlie Kirk. Uh, this guy has to be one of the stupidest commentators. Like, like I understand people that listen to like Ben Shapiro or whatever. And like, I get it. He sounds smart. He sounds articulate. He speaks fast. He throws at you a lot of information. You're like, oh, he seems pretty smart. Charlie Kirk is just like an outward dunce, like a just complete dunce. Anyway. 
uh, this clip illustrates it quite well in case you aren't familiar with his commentary. Um, I, I'm sure you'll agree with me after listening to this. Uh, and also, this is just proof that most people, not everyone, but a lot of people on the Christian far right, uh, they pretend to be in favor of freedom of religion, but really they want a, a Christian theocracy. They want America to be a theocracy um, that's centered around Christianity. And again, this this clip proves it uh, better than any one that I've seen so far. Let's take a look and then we'll respond. I don't believe in religious freedom for Satanists. I don't. Religious freedom means Christian freedom and Jewish freedom and other types of religions that I think are acceptable. But we should totally ban Satanists from the public square. Again, Kelly doesn't have an opinion on the this. Opinions heard on this. <laughs> but no, but what I'm saying, oh, yeah, though, is would... that like they believe in like child pedophilia and they call themselves a religion. Right. So and I know why First Liberty has to say what you say and all that. But no, like that's not a religion. It's not. And so we cloak Christian liberty under religious freedom, and I think that's helpful in the courts. But I refuse to believe the founding fathers thought the fruits of liberty would include the American Satanist convention. I, I don't believe in religious freedom for Satan. <laughs> he, he, just, he just he doesn't need to go any further. I don't believe in religious freedom, obviously, Charlie. But yeah, uh, Gavin, I know you have a, a, a rant brewing about this. So, so what are your thoughts and reaction to this? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the first obvious, you know, thing to say when you hear this is uh, a religion that believes in child pedophilia or has a, a strong association with child pedophilia. Satanism is really the first one that comes to mind. Are you sure you're not thinking about the uh, <clears throat> Catholic Church, literally the largest, most notorious child sex ring in the history of human civilization? I, I was reading an article about how just in France, the Catholic Church just in France was found to be responsible for like 300,000 plus cases of child rape and molestation just in france the catholic church is all over the world obviously here in america too it's a huge problem historically and continues to be um the catholic church which obviously is christian uh is quite literally responsible for the most pedophilia as one organization ever could or has been uh so you know that's obviously just the obvious hypocrisy right there um you're going to really accuse the satanists of being child pedophiles and again you know we've talked to lucian greaves the uh the founder and leader of the the satanic temple uh you guys if you're not familiar i mean yeah the satanic temple the satanic religion whatever people that subscribe to it they, they like to you know cloak themselves with the edgy imagery and you know satanism and all that stuff but really all it is is an organization of people that are interested in preserving the separation of church and state most of their you know actions most of their protests have to do with protesting and exposing the hypocrisy of Christians who pretend to be in favor of a separation of church and state, but then, for example, want to erect a Ten Commandments monument on the lawn of the Oklahoma state capitol or, or something like that. That's you know a, a lot of what they do. And then the other thing they focus on primarily is preserving women's rights to have an abortion and preserving uh, women's rights to bodily autonomy in the first place. That's basically their main mission. And, and like I said, we've literally had Lucian Greaves on our podcast. We talked about it. Would love to chat with him again. So, you know, you can be like, I don't love the imagery. I don't love, you know, people with Baphomet shirts on or whatever the fuck. Uh, you know, it's not for everyone, but to pretend that the Satanists are like out here, you know, actually doing like, you know, fucking sacrifices and raping kids and like all this evil shit. It's just so stupid. It's so uninformed. And again, hypocritical considering uh, the Catholic Church, which is an organ of the Christian religion, which you are part of, Charlie, uh, is responsible for more pedophilia, more child rape than the Satanists could ever, ever catch up to. Not in a million fucking years. Yeah, I mean, the the that that's not really going to be the pillar you want to lot uh you want to lean on if you're making the argument right about religious freedom. It's like, oh, we can't let the child pedophiles in. Oh, okay, well, you're barking up the wrong tree. Do you want to salvage Christian rights in this country, right? Um, look, I you know you you know kind of like I believe you can you know believe and do whatever. I do believe in actual religious freedom, even if you're a crazy fucker like Charlie Kirk. Um, but yeah, uh, one of the interesting things about the a satanic temple is exactly what you said, Gavin. Uh, they're more interested in, in in making sure that the separation of church and state exists. And also, you know, kind of closing up some of those weird loopholes for like these mega churches that are actually just businesses that make people like Joel Osteen, like fucking fortunes. 
uh, and they don't pay taxes on it and all that kind of corrupt shit. Like, if you guys go back to the really early days of secular talk and Kyle Kalinske, those were videos that he used to make all the time because he was one of the new atheist guys. Uh, and if you go and just look on some of his, like, most watched videos of all time, you see some really interesting takedowns of the, like, extreme wealth of those, uh, you know, mega church pastors and all, the, uh, all that kind of stuff, the, the televangelists and all those things. So that's definitely uh, one thing. And then also, I, I just remember this because you brought it up. You remember when they did have that big protest in Oklahoma when we were in high school where they wanted, uh, you know, to put the uh, Baphomet statue up there with the uh, Ten Commandments. And they also the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster wanted to have a statue up there as well. That's actually the first piece of writing that I ever published in my school paper uh, was when I covered that story. Uh, so a little fun fact. Nice. I think I actually wrote a similar article in my paper. Yeah, Zach and I have been covering the Satanism beat for a while. And yeah, I think the, I think the Church of Satan is hella based. I would love to talk to uh, Lucian Greaves again. They're stalwart defenders of uh, abortion rights as well as uh, the separation of church and state. And they've done some absolutely brilliant you know, protests in that respect. I highly recommend the documentary Hail Satan from, I think, 2019. Great documentary that goes into their uh, attempt to get a Baphomet statue erected next to the Ten Commandments statue, of course, to protest and point out the hypocrisy. Um, great documentary. And, and it shows you that these guys are they're, they're really just like down to earth, normal people. Uh, maybe not normal is the right word, but, you know, they're they're reasonable, good people that are mostly just interested in serious, uh, serious issues. So, yeah, I highly recommend that documentary if you haven't seen it. Uh, and, yeah, I, I fuck with Satanism for sure um, and not Charlie Kirk. Uh, yeah, Charlie Kirk is such a fucking idiot. And, and yeah, way to just be like, yeah, I do not actually support uh, freedom of religion. It's like, okay, I, uh, don't you claim to be like a, a constitutionalist or whatever? Don't you claim to care about the foundation of this country? Well, guess what, motherfucker? The founding fathers thought that it was important, important for a separation of church and state and for people to actually be able to freely practice their fucking religion, which is why I have no problem with people that practice Christianity. Obviously, uh, you should do whatever you want as long as it's not infringing on my rights, as long as uh, it's not violating that separation between church and state. Of course, I think you should have every right to practice whatever crazy ass bullshit religion you want to. So, you know, that's how it should be. And it's just crazy that someone like Charlie Kirk can extend that same logic to other, uh, you know, religions or organizations. And again, I would say majority of people that are participate in, in Satanism in the modern day America, they don't actually believe in Satan. Like if you talk to your average Satanist, it's not like they go to bed every night and like pray to Lucifer, like, please make me rich and heal my broken bones and, you know, give me good fortune. Like most Satanists don't actually believe in Lucifer. They don't actually believe in any higher power. For the most part, there are exceptions, but for the most part, these are secular people that just like the iconography and they like the aesthetic of Satanism. And again, it's kind of an edge you know rebuttal to the christian you know majority in this country which is why it's embraced by people like myself so you know that is what it is it's worth talking about and and obviously charlie kirk is a dumbass we we rarely even talk about idiots like this just because it's so obvious how stupid they are and it's not even very intellectually engaging for zach and i to destroy their arguments just because again it's like it's like yeah might as well talk about some crazy person on the side of the might road. Wait, play waffle ball instead exactly uh, but this instance was just so outrageous and also, uh, it, it does intersect with my interest in, in Satanism. So I figured we'd talk about it. Uh, but yeah, crazy stuff, huh? Yeah, man. Charlie Kirk never fails to make himself look like a fucking idiot. Whenever I turn I never watched Charlie Kirk. I watched a little bit of his debur debate, debate, uh, his debate with Ben Burgess. And I watched like maybe like 30 minutes of his debate with Vosh, um, because that, that was just too much for me. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, and then, didn't he debate Kyle Kalinske back in the day too? So I, I have been exposed to Charlie Kirk, even though I usually only get him when he's on like a podium, just spouting all kinds of weird shit. And not when he's in the warm embrace of one of his own, which he clearly was there, uh, unfortunately gives you the shivers, but yeah. Um, Noteworthy that he didn't even he didn't even consider that like what a third of the population is uh, is is Muslim and maybe more I don't fucking know uh, and that was not on the list of approved religions that he was going to accept he was like you know Christianity Judaism and uh, other religions that we find acceptable I was like damn dog no like what are you you're going to pretend you don't hate Muslim people and then you're going to ban their religion like what the fuck is the matter with you like anyway this isn't a joking matter Charlie Kirk is literal scum of the earth but. It is what it is. You gotta laugh at a guy that's such a just a fucking dogged piece of shit, um, as Charlie Kirk is. But we have one more actual serious story. Um uh a bit of a uh piggyback victory lap, if you will, from here at the Vanguard. Uh gonna go ahead and do some uh follow-up on, on a story you guys might remember. Hunter Biden, Ukraine. 
uh, which also, guys, we've pointed this out already, but I'm going to shout it out one more time, uh, really leads to some credence to those arguments about why, uh, you know, uh, Putin was angry about uh, Biden becoming president. And that was what led him to dis- like you know, Biden's had his hand in the Ukrainian honeypot. That's all I'm saying. Right. But if you point that out, you're some sort of like a right wing fucking Russian propagandist or whatever. Uh, not anymore, though, because the New York Times, the paper of record, uh, now admits that the Biden laptop falsely called Russian disinformation by many, many people is authentic. Uh, so definitely a bit of a bombshell, although uh, it was pretty obvious to myself and I think you as well, Zach, from the beginning that this was a legitimate. Um, but yeah, let's take a look at Glenn's article. And then I specifically want to take a look at TYT's coverage of this whole situation, both their coverage now that it's been officially confirmed by the New York Times, uh, but also back before it was officially confirmed, and specifically as it related to Glenn Greenwald and his exit from The Intercept, which essentially was over this exact issue, right? So let's take a look here at his article on Substack. We can read just a little bit about this before we get into the TYT videos, because those are pretty fucking crazy if I do say so myself. But yeah, let's take a look at Glenn Greenwald's article uh, and and uh, obviously, guys, we don't agree with Glenn Greenwald on everything, but this is an issue that he was 100% right on and has been totally and completely vindicated on. I think it's very, very fair to say that. And honestly, if I was um, the Intercept or whoever his editor was at the time, I would straight up apologize to him. For Betsy trying- Reed. Yeah, and I forget who it was, but it was a specific editor that basically straight up censored or attempted to censor his article on this issue at the time. Uh, but we'll get into all that in a second. Anyway, Glenn Greenwald reports, one of the most successful disinformation campaigns in modern American electoral history occurred in the weeks prior to the 2020 presidential election. On October 14th, less than two, three weeks before Americans were set to vote, the nation's oldest newspaper, the New York Post, began publishing a series of reports about the business dealings of the Democratic frontrunner Joe Biden and his son Hunter in countries which Biden, as vice president, wielded considerable influence, including Ukraine and China, and would again if elected president. Obviously, that turned out to be very true. The backlash against this reporting was immediate and intense, leading to the suppression of the story by U.S. corporate media outlets and censorship of the story by leading Silicon Valley monopolies. This disinformation campaign against the reporting was led by the CIA's all but official spokesperson, Natasha Bertnard. I don't know how to pronounce her name. Uh, Then of Politico, now with CNN, whose article on October 19th appeared under this headline, Hunter Biden's story is Russian disinfo, dozens of former Intel officials say. And this was a line that was parroted across mainstream media. And and Saki said that. Right. Everyone said that uh, basically just the go to line every time something comes out that they don't want to have reported on or exposed. Oh, it was it was Russian disinformation. You know, uh, no, word, no, no, nothing to see here. Move on. Uh, so, yeah, he goes on to say these former Intel officials did not actually say that the Hunter Biden story is Russian disinfo. Instead, they stressed in their letter, letter the opposite, namely that they had no evidence to suggest the emails were falsified or that Russia had anything to do with them. But instead, they merely intuited this suspicion based on their experience. So they just bullshit it 100%. Um, uh, He goes on to say, but a media that was overwhelmingly desperate to ensure Trump's defeat had no time for facts or annoying details, such as what these former officials actually said or whether it was in fact true. They had an election to manipulate. As a result, that these Russian the, these emails were Russian disinformation, meaning that they were fake and that Russia manufactured them, became an article of faith among the U.S. justifiably despised class of media officials so do you want to comment at all on this sec before we move on to the tyt coverage yeah i just i mean look man it, it's one of those things where we kind of called this months ago too where you look at this it's obviously correct it's obviously a real laptop it's hunter biden it's super incriminating uh there's no real way about it but they're so wrapped up in this like russiagate pathology they're willing to spit whatever former intel officials uh say back to the public whatever creates their narrative they want trump to lose they don't want anything that uh, that will uh stand in the way of uh joe biden's election chances so uh they label it fucking you know all the hallmarks of russian disinformation and all that shit which was peddled uh the white house press secretary uh all all kinds of newsrooms across the country uh said the same thing and and all kinds of people on twitter that should have known fucking better uh did the same thing uh and we were over here like saying like this looks real 
Uh, I don't. I don't know it's the most important news, but it's definitely real. Uh, and now, as you've seen the fucking, you know, uh, last couple of years unfold, the Ukrainian situation has reared its head again. Now you're like, oh, well, this is why mainstream media didn't want people thinking about this, knowing about this. They don't want uh, people to understand the lengthy back history between Joe Biden and uh, Ukrainian oligarchs and places like Burisma and uh, why Why were they paying his kid like 50 grand a month or something? His crackhead child. Like, I'm sorry, I'm not I'm not fucking demeaning people who struggle with the drug abuse. Right. Like, that's fine. But let's not pretend that Hunter Biden didn't have every opportunity to succeed and still fuck up. And then only through sheer nepotism, get that per- position at uh, Burisma. Of course he did. Right. Um, you know. Uh, and, and the reason why I'm extra hard on the guy is because his fucking father, who he's, you know, warmly embracing right here, it appears, uh, would put fucking kids in jail for their whole fucking life for crack. OK, literally wrote the bill that would put you three strikes, all that shit. You remember that? That was his daddy. OK, uh, what the fuck? Yep, absolutely. And yeah, that, that's the real issue with the uh, obviously, you know. Uh, anyone that's struggling with drug addiction has my sympathy. Um, but what makes it so outrageous and just hypocritical is that, you know, there's literal pictures of Hunter Biden, you know, with crack pipes in his mouth, incriminating evidence of him doing crack and other drugs. Uh, and meanwhile, his own father is li- quite literally responsible, as you said, Zach, for the imprisonment of an entire generation plus of uh, mostly black men uh, for drug crimes. Meanwhile, your own son is a fucking degenerate. So, yeah, it's, it's totally crazy. Um, but let's take a listen to some of TYT's coverage. They put out this video, I think yesterday, yeah, reporting on this new development. Uh, and I want to contrast their tone in this video with a video they put out in November of 7th of 2020 when Glenn Greenwald left The Intercept essentially over this exact story and him calling it correctly at the time. Uh, so let's take a listen to this video. And then we'll not the whole video. We'll watch some of it and then we'll move on to the one from over a year ago. Uh, But yeah, let's take a listen here. Let's check it out. Turns out that Hunter Biden is still experiencing a Justice Department investigation on two separate issues. One of those issues is the idea that he failed to pay taxes on earnings from jobs he did in foreign countries. Turns out he later paid a million dollars in back taxes. Super, super scintillating story. The other issue has to do with him possibly failing to file as a foreign agent while he was working for companies in other countries. So let's start off with his laptop, of course. Turns out that there are emails that were retrieved from a laptop that he left behind at a repair store. And this wasn't it, news months ago. Changes. We learn a little more about his back and forth with a business partner in regard to whether they should file as foreign agents. So prosecutors have also asked about potential FARA violations by the by Washington consulting firm Blue Star Strategies that worked for the Ukrainian energy company in an arrangement that Biden helped broker according to documents and the people familiar with the investigation. Of course, the dogs is a big plus. Everybody loves it. We get to work with dogs every day. I mean, that's that's the big bonus of all of it. We focus on. Now, let's talk about the emails. Uh, according to reporting from the New York Times, in the April 2014 email, Hunter Biden indicated that Burisma's officials, quote, need to know in no uncertain terms that we will not and cannot intervene directly with domestic policymakers and that we need to abide by the Foreign Agents Registration Act or FARA and any other US laws in the strictest sense across the board. Whoa, that seems bad. Yeah, Anna, that's my point. That's my point. Uh, Okay, I just want you guys to briefly consider, right? This is TYT after all. How would they be reporting on this if you swapped the names and nothing else? You could just, I I swear to God, they probably wouldn't even notice if you just put two pieces of paper in front of them. And instead of having the name Hunter and Joe Biden, you just had Donald and Don Jr. in those fucking positions right now. (gasps) Oh! Oh, is it the smoking gun Jank would have been looking for for the past four fucking years? Is he fucking longer than that now? Jesus Christ, six years that they've died on the Russiagate Hill? 
Are you fucking kidding me? They would have been, they would have, the 10, 15 clips, breaking, smoking gun, Trump's going down, DOJ involved. You know, and then they would be making all of these things like out like oh, Trump's own DOJ is turning on him. You the know, walls are closing in. Exactly. It would have been all wall to wall coverage of that kind of shit. Right. And Gavin and I would have been here being like, yeah, I got, this is a bit, uh, this is a story. It's corrupt as shit. We already told you a million times Donald Trump is corrupt as shit. We already told you that, you know, this was real corruption, blah, blah, blah. But if we want to get him on something, we have way more like you know things to get him on the emoluments laws we, we went all over this this is literally documented on our channel okay we talked about this uh a lot back then but anyway uh just re completely ridiculous the way that they uh, completely shift how they cover this after trying to portray themselves as like uh, not an, a democrat affiliate they're, they're obviously the running cover for joe yeah they pretend to be above partisanship until it comes to an instance like this in which they're the most fucking partisan losers of all time um it kind of reminds me of the whole when Hillary was under uh, federal investigation for her use of a private email server, um, it's the exact same thing. A lot of a lot of you know commentators on the left, a lot of like democratically aligned commentators were like, "Oh, this it's no big deal, man. It's nothing to see here." It's like it kind of is a big deal, dude. And if the shoe was on the other foot, if a Republican were doing that, obviously you'd be calling them out for a brazen violation of their ethical responsibilities. Like it's just annoying when you, the partisan blinders are so thick. That they can't just be like, oh, yeah, this is worth talking about. Obviously, this man's about to potentially be one of the most powerful people, if not the most powerful person in the entire world. Maybe we should look into his son's corrupt dealings in a country which, guess what, has proven to have major geopolitical fucking, you know, uh, relations here now that the Biden presidency is underway. Um, so anyway, let, let's take a little bit more look at this video. And then, like I said, I want to go back in time over a year and check out their video from November 7th of 2020. But yeah, let's listen to it. just a bit more of this. So th let me weigh in on this story. Uh, we now have firm conclusions, Hunter Biden and his laptop. Okay, first, let me just declare our bias in this case is approximately 0%. Lie. We don't give a damn about Hunter Biden. We don't care if he's innocent. We don't care if he's guilty. He ain't my hero. He yeah. just opened so up by saying, let me lie to you. Biden, yeah, so you just heard that. Oh, Jenks, he's above the partisanship. He don't give a fuck. This is all just, you know, calling balls and strikes. We don't care about Joe Biden. We're team progressive over here at TYT. Country the, Western Jenks. Yeah, exactly. So you guys saw that. I think you I think you get the gist. I think you get the gist. Now that it's officially been, you know, the New York Times is weighed in. Now Jake's like, what do you mean? We've always been right on this. Let's take a look back in time. Like I said, let's go back in the time machine to November 7th of 2020. I'm sure you guys remember when Glenn Greenwald left The Intercept because he basically tried to write an article about the situation as it was actually happening. Um, and, and he got this really condescending note from their editor saying like, you know, uh, this isn't quite this isn't quite vetted properly or like your journalism isn't quite up to par. You need to do some more fact checking and make less declarative statements and, and all this bullshit when the whole uh, con Glenn Greenwald's contract from the beginning of The Intercept specified that he wasn't supposed to be uh, you know, having to deal with an editor in that sense. He was supposed to be able to, you know, write the articles that he wanted to uh, and maybe editorialize a little bit too. It's not like everything he necessarily says is 100% a declaration of fact. It's Glenn Greenwald's writing. I think everyone understands that. Uh, but the point is that he was 100% correct, although at the time, TYT wasn't quite willing to give him that credit. And that's demonstrated right now in a video that I'm about to play. Uh, did you want to share this real quick, Zach? It was basically just backing up exactly what you said. So I've just grabbed the tweet from when uh, Glenn formally tendered his resignation. Uh, you know, my resignation from the intercept, the same trends of repression, censorship, and ideological hom homogeny, uh, or homogeneity, hom homogeneity, uh, fuck, I can't read, plaguing the national press generally have engulfed the media outlet I co-founded, culminating in censorship of my own articles. I got to email Glenn and be like, can you use like smaller words so that I can read them on my podcast? Um, the final precipitating cause is that the Intercept's editors censored an article I wrote this week, refusing to publish it unless I removed all sections critical of Joe Biden, the candidate, the candidate vehemently supported by all Intercept editors involved in this effort at suppression. Uh, I did go ahead and look. The, it looks like the only name he names is Betsy Reed, who's the editor in chief, and obviously would have had the like a uh, final say on it, at least in the thread that I saw. Um, you know, none of the conflict had anything to do with uh, the Intercept Brazil, whose journalism I continue to have the highest regard for and hope it remains 
supported. Uh, Jeremy Scahill is in the same position as I, not part of these decisions at all, uh, you know. Uh, but either way, just wanted to clarify everything for everybody. He basically got fucked all the way up to the top by the editor in chief, um, you know, from the publication he founded uh, and basically is only known about because of the journalism that him and um, a few uh, like Laura Poitras uh, did with Edward Snowden. So anyway. Right. And also I did just look it up. It, it looks like the editor was Peter Moss, M-A-A-S, Peter M-A-A-S. That was the uh editor which interfered or tried to interfere with glenn greenwald's original piece and of course that precipitated his exit entirely from the intercept a publication he co-founded some years ago and uh he went off and you Did know you imagine thinking that was a good professional idea i know right it's crazy anyway he started a Substack, and the rest is history uh but yeah let's take a listen to what tyt was sounding like at the time that that actually went down and see what kind of charitability they gave Glenn Greenwald and an issue which now, of course, he's been completely and utterly vindicated on. Um, but yeah, let's take a listen. Uh, China. So I wouldn't say the story is not at all verified, but I certainly wouldn't say the story is verified. I wouldn't want a giant story going, oh my God, what a huge earthquake here in this election. And, and honestly, Glenn is obsessed with Russia. And I've said that to his face and if he comes on, I'll say it again to his face. So he goes on a tangent about how people are saying that this might be a Russian operation. You want to criticize that? I'm with you. I don't see any reason why this is a Russian operation. And so they, they, you've got to right. present evidence, and they haven't presented evidence of that. So if you wanted to make that point, that's not that controversial point at all, right? But then to turn around and make it seem like this is a giant land breaking story right before the election, well, it, it misses the context so much that I fear that it becomes purposely misleading. So I'll give you an example, and it's the same one we've been talking about here, but in a different context, the Alex Morse case. So Alex Morse, the progressive candidate in Massachusetts, he's running as a terrible corporate Democrat. He was in the primary. And right before the election, a story got leaked about how Alex Morse was hitting on students at colleges, right? Alex happens to be gay, and so there was a little bit of a homophobic uh, strain to that accusation. So just to interject here, Jake is, and again, this was from 2020, Jake is literally comparing uh, the release of Hunter Biden's emails, which basically exposed his corruption as Joe Biden's son. He's comparing that to the disingenuous smear campaign against progressive Democrat Alex Morse, who was unfairly labeled some sort of predator because he had a relationship with you know someone that he went to the same school as or something that he taught at rather. It wasn't even a student. He didn't even hit on them, et cetera. Absolutely no comparison there. Literally no comparison. Uh, one thing is something that voters absolutely should know about before potentially voting for this guy, Joe Biden. I think we deserve to know if his son was involved in some skaty, sketchy, shady corruption. Uh, and, and who cares if it's two weeks before the election? Like, what? what? Why does that matter? It could have been released at any point. Who cares? People deserve to know that. Uh, and, and you're acting like, oh, this is some sort of smear against Joe Biden that was you know, leaked by the Russians, or I guess not the Russians, to his credit, he did uh, you know, do away with that notion. But still, acting like this is some sort of like sneaky psyop kind of thing, like, oh, this was the, the, the broader context reveals that this is actually just a smear campaign against Joe Biden. When now, all these months later, we found out that no, it wasn't a smear campaign against Biden. I mean, sure, it was opposition research like every competent campaign engages in, but it wasn't a smear. It was all 100% correct. It was all 100% correct here. And the story that Jenk and Anna completely missed on was not the fact that it it was released two weeks before the election. The story was that it was censored by the media, which clearly is in bed with the Democratic establishment two weeks before the election. Can you imagine if the shoe was on the other foot? Like the, the story here is that the Democratic Party in collusion with the mainstream media censored this information, censored this article. You couldn't even share the link on Twitter. They labeled it Russian information, misinformation. They labeled true, actual information about Joe Biden and his son as Russian disinformation and stopped people from sharing it in a prevent to ensure Joe Biden's victory. That's what we're, that is. How is that not the obvious story here? Like this is Orwellian level censorship. This is like what they do in fucking China. It, you know, this is insane. 
uh, for you to sit here and completely and utterly miss the point. And while you're at it, smear Glenn Greenwald and, and pretend like he wouldn't know what's legitimate information. Are you familiar with his credentials? Uh, do you, are you familiar with the Edward Snowden story? Um, so to sit here and act like, oh, Glenn Greenwald's just some dumbass that doesn't know what information should be trusted and what's disinformation. You know, he's just some moron. Like, no, this is a serious credentialed journalist, uh, the level of which you will never achieve, Jank. Uh, how fucking dare you? You owe him an apology. Yeah, I mean, this is, you can unpack this for so many fucking hours, right? Because there's so many layers to what goes wrong in the American media discord, all the way from mainstream neoliberalism to this, like, you know, uh, weird, like, corporate progressivism that we've seen the uh, Young Turks kind of adopt in the age of the uh, the Biden administration. It's really strange. But yeah, you, you made the ex exact point that I was going to make, which is that the real fucking story here is the fact that the internet was able to collude to ban the New York Post for something that was 100% true, uh, shut down and silence any dissent or discussion on the internet about this, pretend or plant these uh, completely substanceless and uh, evidenceless based claims that this was somehow Russian disinformation, right? Uh, when it completely was not, it was obviously real, right? It was obviously real. You look at that laptop, who fucking took those pictures of uh, Hunter Biden, a fucking Russian agent? Give, give me a fucking break, okay? Yeah, uh, twist my arm to believe that a crack addict's not that smart at encrypting his laptop, okay? Yeah, maybe he fucking forgot it somewhere. And look, I don't mean to demean the guy for his fucking struggles. I'm just telling you that when you're on crack or any of the other kind of drugs that fuck up your teeth like meth, uh, you're going to forget a lot of shit when you're done with it. So, of course, uh, you know, he probably wasn't taking all of these precautions. It wasn't even look, it didn't even look like he was encrypting any of his emails when he was talking about literal financial crimes. OK, not the sharpest tool in the shed. You can easily look at this if you know what you're looking for and be like, yeah, this is shady corruption. So, again, I want everybody to imagine for like 30 seconds as Jank tries to portray himself as this like unbiased, like uh, federer of information because he's not going to just outright label it Russian disinformation with no evidence. Oh, OK. Now that sets the table as if I'm like a neutral arbiter of what's happening when it absolutely doesn't. And, and again, not to make the same point twice, but had this been Donald Trump with Don Jr. and the entire internet two weeks before the election, you had Twitter, Facebook, all coming together to remove uh, a damning collection of Don Jr. doing crack and having like a bunch of ties to the, like, uh, you know, let's say the Saudis or the Russian government, right, instead of Ukraine. Holy shit, guys. Jake would be pulling out his hair. He would be talking about how this is uh, an abomination. You know, I'll think I would also be doing that. It's just I'm still doing it now. I'm still doing it now. Uh, and yeah, you're 100 percent right that they need to run a retraction. They need to do an open mouthed apology, which, of course, they'll never fucking do. Uh, but it's just completely absurd to me um, that people are just going to like, oh, backpedal on this and be like, oh, Maybe there was something serious to this. And even and it, and it creates this like weird trap where we like fall into the corporate framing that financial crimes aren't that serious. Right. Like, oh, the nepotism that is evoked by those most in our highest offices is like, oh, that's trivial news. Right. So even people who I like their coverage, like Crystal and Sager, they were like apologizing for covering this. They were like, oh, this isn't the most like important news. I'm like, guys. Like, obviously, I've run the I, I, I run half the vanguard, so I, I'm not here to preach about like, oh, you got to cover them up. But they want you to think that this is unserious because it's their corruption. Right. It, this is a bold faced example of what uh, the haves can do. Right. Uh, you know, everybody loves to uh, uh, quote the old Carlin joke. You know, it's a big club and you ain't in it. Right. Well, the people who are in this fucking club are corrupt as shit and their kids get put on board for fifty thousand dollars a month and they can come up with a million dollars to pay off the IRS with somehow, even though he has absolutely no skills. And I don't even think he's smarter than a very dumb fourth grader. So I just think that all of these things we have to consider on top of the extremely censorious, you know, Twitter storm. All the why in the face of this, guys, now I'm looking at anybody who cheerled for fucking censorship on the Internet in any kind of vague way, guys, um, during COVID and during the Joe Rogan meltdown and during all these things. Do you not understand that you're just emboldening them to lie to us and curate the news we get right before an election again? That's exactly what's going to happen. And that's the tools that we're giving. This is all so fucked. There's like... I mean, this is this is we save this for the end for a reason. This is like this is the uh, fucking important story. 
Right. And and for Jank and Anna to sit here and be like, well, our issue with this is that Jank, or that Glenn is making too many uh, declarative statements and that he's really, you know, over the top in his wording. It's like, I, I remember when you guys were covering Russiagate day in and day out saying, oh, the walls are closing in. Tick, 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 tick. Bob Mueller is going to come out and take down Trump and like all this stupid bullshit making declarative statements like there was no fucking tomorrow for you to turn around. And again, ac accuse Glenn Greenwald, an actual journalist who was 100 percent right on this issue of just being like some sort of, you know, mouthpiece for the right wing. And like he's a useful idiot. And he's just covering this because it's it's sensational and because he hates Joe Biden or whatever. Like, no, it's not Glenn Greenwald. What's that quote? You said Glenn Greenwald quote. It's like it's not my excuse to protect your dog shit candidate. Yeah, he had this quote uh, that I wrote down one time when this was all going down. He was like, it's not my job to help your bullshit candidate win this election. And I was like. Right. It's not any journalist's job to protect any candidate, Republican or Democrat. It is their job to report on the information, regardless of when it comes out. Uh, and yeah, opposition research is nothing new. Pretty much there's always some big dump, like some huge, crazy dump. Uh, what do they call it? The October surprise or something? You know, th that's nothing new, motherfucker. Stop acting like this is crazy. And again, I feel like everyone just moved on way too quickly from how insane the censorship was of this article when it came out. Again, it, it would be one thing. Uh, I would still be against it in principle if they had censored this article and it actually had turned out to be fake. Like, you know, say the Hunter Biden laptop thing actually had turned out to be fake and it was just manufactured by Rudy Giuliani and the Russians or whatever. I would still be against them censoring it, but at least then they would be like, all right, well, we censored it because it was fake and here's the proof, et cetera. No, this was all legit. And we're finding it out now over a year later. Uh, it's like it was all 100% legit and they straight up censored it. Like not in that they didn't deplatform it. They, no, they actually censored it. They stopped people from sharing the link. Do you not understand what kind of precedent this sets? Like, are you what? And and again, for Jank and Anna, their their whole shtick is anti-corruption, anti-big money in politics, and they're gonna sit here and you know sanit wash over this huge story about corruption when it was actually happening, only for them to come out a couple years later and be like. We're we're not a but we're not you know fucking partisan hacks. Uh, we're honest commentators and we tell it like it is. Like bullshit. You guys are so full of dog shit. It's insane that anyone defends these fucking clowns or takes their coverage on anything seriously. Uh, and and you know you don't even have to. I, I just it's so easy to fucking expose. Yeah, it's almost like feels like covering. I almost made a joke. I almost, it's almost like reacting to the majority report. No, it's like it's so fucking. It's an easy lift, guys. I'm not that smart, right? I, I'm not. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a philistine, as they put it, uh, in in uh, those academic terminologies, right? Uh, but it's, it's clear as day here. Uh, that letting the letting the elites not uh, like control the flow of information and let dumb fuckers like me not make up our own minds is going to lead to some more problems. Uh, for the rest of us, when we want things like equality, health care, uh, you know, to not see our our brothers and sisters gunned down by the fucking police at an obnoxious fucking raid as they terrorize communities, all that kind of shit that we uh, prioritize as leftists. Uh, that's going to go first. Right. That's going to go just like this was this was the perfect example of how they're exactly going to sneak in there. We need Joe Biden. We need fucking crime bill. Joe, who's not going to do a damn thing about the police after, though, in the wake of uh, the this uh, history uh, breaking this global, this uh, global, national pre, uh, 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 display of uh, uh, demands uh, to defund the police explicitly, you know, uh, in the face of the tragedy of the George Floyd killing, but also Breonna Taylor and the countless other names that people, um, you know, shouted at the top of their lungs as we, you know, tried our best to defund the police department, all these kinds of things. I'm on a hill here, uh, but this is all going to fucking go. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not good. Yeah, it's just it's just totally disgraceful. Um, yeah. Anyway, I guess that probably concludes our stream for today, Zach. Unless there's anything else you're dying to get to. I've been going for so fucking long. I hope there's nothing else that I have to get through. Let me see here. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think. Oh wait, there's one thing we talked about reacting to that I don't care if we get to it or if we punt until tomorrow. But didn't you? Uh, uh, I, I wanted to get your reaction to this. Actually, I'll just throw it up on screen really quickly before we get out of here. This is going to be a fun one for us to react to. This is this is a little bit of a shout out to the one guy who always super chats us about Batman. Gavin, this is the perfect uh, news for you. And I thought since we had a fucked up uh, live stream where we were talking about death and destruction and now miserable, it's all going to go. Uh, I, I saw that Nicolas Cage reached out to Warner Brothers 
saying uh, he'll participate as any number of terrifying villains. Um, and uh, Cage said via IGN, I'm excited to see it. I haven't seen it yet. The villain that Vincent Price played in the 1960s show Egghead. I think I want to have a go at Egghead. I think I can make him absolutely terrifying. I have a concept for Egghead. So let them know at, we're at Warner Brothers. I'm down for Egghead. First off, Gavin, do you know who Egghead is? I do not actually never watched the OG Batman show. Not familiar with Egghead as a villain. Uh, so that would that would be interesting me, to have to let learn. Let me share my screen and get that. Okay. <laughs> let me let me show you the Egghead because you're gonna you're gonna need you're gonna just downright need to see Nicolas Cage as Egghead once you see this uh, image here. He's literally a man with an Egghead. I he he's gonna have a tough job beating out Howie Mandel, but if he can do it, uh, then, then then it'll be a, it'll be a great performance. Oh God, I am so down for this. Not just the egghead possibility, but in any in any you know uh, character, I would be so down to see Nicolas Cage in the next Batman film. If you guys aren't familiar, we did a whole Colin episode actually talking about the new Batman film. If you're not aware, Zach and I are huge film guys. We love to talk about movies, um, and I was a big fan of the new Batman film. You know, it definitely had some flaws, definitely had some issues, might have been a little bit too long, but still, damn good movie. Such a breath of fresh air after all the you know just schlock garbage coming out of the mcu it's my opinion I'm, I'm sure a lot of people feel differently uh but yeah not a fan of the marvel movies i thought that the new batman film and honestly a lot of the dc content coming out recently is just uh, such a breath of fresh air like i said it's real filmmaking like real vision aesthetic it's not just a bunch of cgi uh interesting plot elements etc edgy dark etc anyway loved the new batman and nicholas cage if you guys aren't familiar is my favorite actor of all time uh not ironically no seriously he is my favorite actor uh a fearless performer someone that embodies every character he takes on even the you know terrible movies he's in he's still always the best thing about them um just such a great physical actor has such a presence on screen he's hilarious uh he's larger than life he's pulls off the kind of performance that very very few actors can so needless to say i would love to see him in the new batman they'd have to play it right tonally uh you know they'd have to uh get him into the right kind of headspace and i think that tool droid actually points out no pun intended yeah exactly <laughs> check out mandy if you're into nicholas cage yes if you guys are only familiar with nicholas cage in like national treasure maybe or like one of the goofier movies it could happen to you <laughs> but yeah if you're only familiar with some of his like goofier mainstream fair uh then i would highly recommend checking out the film mandy um he's excellent in that movie and he's like a goddamn beast in that movie like he's frightening to watch he's downright terrifying uh so yeah he, he's capable of such such great heights as a performer pig another great movie i know that was zach's favorite film of last year uh he's so good in that too a much more subtle and quiet performance from nicholas cage uh but there's so many i mean adaptation it's one of my favorite movies of all time wild at heart by david lynch leaving and, las vegas he's amazing in yeah i mean the guy's just the guy's just an incredible actor so uh, I even love, love him in Gone in 60 Seconds. I'll, I'll, I'll show my ass and let everybody know I fucking love car movies. Uh, and I think that he has this amazing ability as a leading man uh, to just like fucking hold the movie together, even if the script is a little weak. Uh, and, you know, they're really just showing you a bunch of like fast cars in a good soundtrack. Like at least if Nick Cage is in there, like he adds some personality and some charisma uh, to the movie. Um really good um not so much my favorite movie i made a joke about it can happen to you that's a 94 film where he uh wins the lottery and splits half of it with a waitress uh, but even he's pretty good in that movie you know what i mean it's like a likable like you watch it at 12 30 in the afternoon with your sister which is someone you know what i mean it's like one of those kinds of movies um but even then yeah he's just a good good actor steals the show in fast times at ridgemont high with this hot dog hat no i'm kidding and here's Jake Kaufman, my very own Nicolas Cage. No, I'm just kidding. But Jake is the actor in my upcoming short film that I'm working on right now. So shout out to you, Jake. Didn't know you were watching my bullshit podcast, but what's up, bro? Uh, thanks for the super or thanks for the comment. And yeah, uh, Moonstruck is amazing. Couldn't agree more. Uh, yes to giving Nick his props. Um, yeah, Nicolas Cage is, is is the best. He's based as fuck. The Rock is, also fucking great action movie. I don't. I care. thought you were talking about like The Rock, like Dane Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Sean Connery. Yeah. Yeah, I actually never have seen The Rock. That's embarrassing to it's say. It's actually a pretty good film. Is that like a Michael Bay out. movie or something? Yeah, I think it's actually the best movie Michael Bay ever directed. And hear me out. It's not perfect, right? Uh, but I used to like it when I was a kid uh, because I like Sean Connery. And it's basically like uh, 
you know, Sean Connery's on out Al- or he's like the only guy that ever escaped Alcatraz. And then they have to like break into Alcatraz. Otherwise, chemical weapons are going to get shot all over San Francisco or some shit like that. Either way, not like a, you know, fucking Palm Door winner, but a good way to fucking kill an afternoon with a, you know, good action movie. And, the- and usually I don't even like Michael Bay movies, but that one's well paced, well uh, made. that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I've heard it's I've heard it's good. And, you know, Mike Michael Bay movies are not my thing, but I understand why people get into them if you do. Uh, in the same way that I like Godzilla movies, you know, that's obviously not like quality cinema either, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, Nick Cage is based as fuck. Great, great actor. And again, uh, if you, if you really don't think Nicholas Cage is a good actor, watch the movie pig, watch the movie Mandy. Uh, and if you have those, if you have seen those films and you still have this take, then I don't know what to tell you. Um, but trust Even me, Las Vegas adaptation. I mean, he's an amazing actor. Wild at heart. Brilliant. Actor. Bad Lieutenant port of call new Orleans by Werner Herzog. Uh, amazing again wild at heart by david lynch his most underrated film uh such a great great actor such a just magnetic performer you can't take your eyes off the guy um but not everyone feels the same way unfortunately uh i will continue to rep nicholas cage and his chops as an actor um but yeah i guess we're a little bit off topic now yeah i mean i'm sure he's still broke that dude spends money like a motherfucker that's like asking if fucking johnny depp is broke they're both broke what's funny about those two actually fun segue and then we'll get the fuck off this microphone the reason that johnny depp is an actor and not a musician is literally because of nicholas cage so when they were uh homies back in the day uh you know uh johnny depp famously he wanted to become a rock and roll star that's why he does like weird cameos with alice cooper and kind of other boomy or kind of cringy shit later in his career but anyway uh he moves to los angeles he's gonna be a big star he's handsome as hell and he's hanging out with nicholas cage and Nicholas Cage is like, hey, man, you should make money acting. I, you know, my family does this shit. And you, sir, look like the kind of guy that could get paid to do this, you know, because he was gorgeous. If you look at uh, pictures of Johnny Depp from the 80s, I mean, just a very handsome, pretty looking man. Uh, so he auditioned. He said his first ever audition. He got the fucking uh, part that he got in uh, Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street. So that never fucking happens. If you know anybody that's ever been in that, you never get your first fucking audition. So that shows you the kind of career that trajectory that Johnny Depp was going to go on. Then, uh, uh, you know, whatever, but it's just a, a wild fact that now he's way more famous than even Nicolas Cage. Yeah, that is that is pretty crazy. Um, and also, Matthew points out Lord of War. Uh, all you lefties out there, go watch Lord of War. Great movie about the arms trade and how essentially the U.S. is the number one you know dealer of weapons and, and guns in particular across the world. That. Great, great movie. Yeah, that's Such a great where movie. His brother's like a coke addict, and he sells all the weapons. It's kind of like an early war dogs. Yeah, exactly. It is a lot like War Dogs, which is another great look at the kind of like the military industrial complex. Let's relive uh, every movie, Gavin and I have yeah. seen together. <laughs> Start chatting about movies. We should just plan to talk about film for the last like 30 minutes of every stream. That's what I was thinking, actually, because we and now that we're just on a stream where we're talking to only our diehards here because everybody else would have fucking signed the fuck off by now. Uh, we're uh, this Sunday, I think, because I don't have shit going on on Sunday. I don't think Gavin does either. It's going to be beautiful. So we'll probably go for a hike or something in the morning. But then in the evening thing, we're going to do probably like a regular Vanguard stream and then finish it off with some like just open conversations streamers streaming uh play some video games my bust out elden ring uh that kind of shit um so yeah will be a lot of fun if not elden ring we'll play something different uh like grand theft auto 5 or something uh but whatever you guys want to watch let us know uh just as a fun way to keep talking because we do like our regular show it takes about an hour and a half on bu- or two hours on busy days but then it's like i have energy to play video games and keep talking with chat so we're gonna try and do some like more streaming kind of stuff during the week and, and just fucking hanging out with everybody so uh look forward to that dudes and uh if you're in the chat you've already hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed fuck you yeah hit that subscribe comrades what the fuck man uh but yeah we are going to be getting into some gaming in the near future if not yeah like you said this sunday we're hoping to get it up and running um so uh we'll be simulcasting to youtube and twitch but do subscribe to us on twitch as well if you haven't already especially because with all the censorship on youtube uh you know in the event that our channel got fucked with uh it'd be good to have uh you know the twitch yeah, also we can't say cracker on twitch god damn it <laughs> exactly we can't say cracker what the fuck are we gonna do uh but yeah uh hit us up on twitch guys make sure to sub to us there again just in case youtube fucks with our channel um it would be good to have a backup uh, I think we have like an embarrassingly low amount of subscribers on Twitch right now, like fucking 35 or something. I know it's fucking nuts, man. I'm like, well, I have more followers on my bullshit Instagram. Than I haven't t- like I it, it's how did that happen? 
<laughs> yeah, so you know, to prevent us from being just the laughing stocks of the Twitch scene, go subscribe to us on Twitch, boost our presence over there again, just in case something happens to us on YouTube. Uh, it would be nice to have like our, our backup as Twitch, and we do simulcast there too. So if you are a Twitch user, then you know that'll be worth it in and of itself. Uh, but go do that, and and we'll we will be uh, streaming some gameplay and some other you know shit talking kind of content. So super excited for that. If there's any specific recommendations you guys would like to see, uh, we'd be happy to do so i'm not the best you know gamer in the world to be fair i don't play a ton of video games we're, we're bad compared <laughs> to other streamers dude we're bad i've watched we've played together i know that i i don't even get embarrassed when i play with gavin and i get embarrassed when i play with a lot of people yeah honestly the only games i'm any good at is like skyrim and gta which is the most basic thing ever but like we're gonna play uh, a lot of gta because we love yeah. to get to five stars we're just generic oh yeah G gta is the best i hope you guys enjoy just like like getting to five stars and you know police chases and all that kind of crap as much as zach and i do we're simpletons but uh yeah gta skyrim we might bust out elden ring although i'm intimidated by it i know it's supposed to be super hard it's probably just gonna be watching us die over and over again but still i think it'll be something fun for you guys to at least watch you know have on the screen while we talk to each other or to a guest you know uh, maybe have some debates with our audience members people can call in and you know, argue with us on, on whatever issue they feel necessary. Uh, and again, it's just something to look at on screen, essentially us running around fucking Skyrim or whatever the hell. Um, but and it's like, it, it could be shit that we won't re-upload either. Like, you'll just kind of have to catch it while we're live because it's not like Gavin's going to want to, uh, for cards on the table, Gavin does our editing because he's a champ. Uh, I doesn't want to sit through just us running around the forest in fucking Skyrim for a while. Oh, did we say anything funny here that we can clip? exactly uh so yeah hit that subscribe button if you have not already also thank you sir switch crookington everyone should watch the movie vivarium i that sounds familiar um i know i've heard of vivarium oh i is this the one where they like have the houses that are all the same man maybe this movie went over my head but i didn't vibe with it sir switch right it is that movie i never watched it but i will sir switch it was on my list. I just never got around to it. Uh, but thanks for the recommendation. I, think I gave it like three out of five stars on Letterboxd. I didn't hate it. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'll check it out. Give it a watch. And thank you also, uh, P Pookie New Jack City, for the two bucks. If you got to watch you live, underrated movie, eight millimeter. That's also one that I haven't seen, uh, but I've heard good things about. Trust me, I've seen most movies. I just haven't seen the ones that people keep bringing up today. Uh, but except for those Nick Cage ones. But this is a Nick Cage movie. Anyway. Uh, I'll check that out too. Thanks so much, Pookie New Jack City. Like your name too. Um, and yeah, I'll check those both out. Thanks so much. And yeah, thanks for subbing to the Twitch Brit. Really appreciate that. Um, but yeah. So we'll get the fuck out of here. Gavin and I need to go get stoned. <laughs> you know what time it is. And unfortunately, I'm so sorry, guys. I promise I'm not bullshitting, but I for whatever reason, it's not letting me share my screen. Uh, I'll try again so you guys can see that I'm not bullshitting. Uh, but you know we like to end our live streams with a huge shout out to the patron community. Unfortunately, that appears to not be a possibility today for whatever reason. I tried once again to share my screen and it's not letting me. Uh, so hopefully by our next stream, that issue is you know resolved. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to share the shout out screen today as we usually always do. That being said, a huge shout out nonetheless to our patron community. We really, really appreciate it. And if you want to get a spot on the shout out screen, so the next time we go live, you can be on there. Um, the link is in the description. If you enjoy the content we create, supporting us on Patreon is our you know lifeblood here at the Vanguard. We could not do the show without you. We would not do the show without you. It just would not be feasible. So thank you so much to the patrons. Uh, really appreciate that. Again, the contributing the con the contributions really do uh, make the show possible. I'll say it once again. But yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, hit that like and subscribe button if you would like to, uh, or even if you wouldn't like to, just fucking do it. Uh, with that being said, goodbye. Yeah, peace out, guys. So long, farewell, out <laughs> feeders, and goodbye. We're gonna get sued by Apple now. <laughs> oh god, now I'm trying to find the live intro. There we go. Peace out, guys. <laughs>